1st of March 2023. Uh, you good, Alana? One minute. We just got to wait till they even pulled it up. Got a bit of a lag with our internet connection. So if anyone missed it, summer's over. <laughs> is Dave Autumn? <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, yep, good to go. Okay, so I'll repeat that. This is the um, council briefing, 1st of March 2023. <coughs> um, we'll move straight into. Technical difficulties. Oh, dear. We can't hear. Mike, looking at the um, council meeting when it was up then, is that really blurry for you? Um, yeah, the the, um, the the middle picture was of the yeah. In, in the yeah. Because if it gets recorded like that, it's not going to be um, no, no ideal to upload that. Yeah, the last um, <laughs> second of it. So just we can get the presentation up. Huh? I'll take the. You, you, you maybe like to raise it, um, Rachel. I, well, I can't even see the. Um... I've just got it in 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 small space up above. Yeah, and it's it's still pointed at the roof. Yeah, it's still pointed at the roof. But it's clear. Yeah. We're, we're, we're aiming high, folks. <laughs> Here you are, and, and it's a bit blurry. Expectations. I assume that might be a problem. That's a... We call this teething problem <laughs> with the new location. Absolutely, we do that. Excellent. <laughs> you rely on Wi Fi technology, eh? It looks clearer. <clears throat> Let's give that a go. Okay, thanks, Anne. Let's get Lana to drive it this way. We, we can't get it up. I'll just talk to them. Yeah. Um, through, through the chair, the slides which he's presenting were circulated by email yesterday. So if you wanted to pull those up online, you can view those. Taking well. five hours. <laughs> so there we go. Taking forever. Well, Thank the room is there, and I'll I'll see that. Uh, on on. Uh, so Howard, can you see the presentation on? Um, not at this stage. So, right, they won't be able to see the presentation because I'm here there. That's right. We'll, we'll, but they just what happened? Listen. So um, those folk online, if you just uh, join on your own devices and and through the link that was provided, and I can only share the presentation to this room, unfortunately. I've got it. I'll just I'll continue, Mr. Mayor, if that's all right. So um, thank you, Councillor, introduced Andy Brown. Um, look, this will be one of many um, briefings that we'll be bringing to you uh, as a result of Cyclone Gabriel, um, and, equal, and similarly uh, the storm event that happened on the 24th um, in Mangafai, Kaiwaka area. So as we get more information, a uh, better definition on, on the actual projects, uh, the scope, uh, and the cost. We'll certainly be bringing more information back. And so the purpose of today is really just to give a, a, an initial um, overview of what happened um, on those on, on that event. Um, some of the information in here is old um, because we had been doing work um, as we uh, proceeded up to today. Uh, but the substantive work is, is still yet to come, and that's. Um, provide some briefings uh, around that today and in future. Don't need to drop. It's not proper.
just a couple of questions, if that's okay, uh, Your Worship. I just noticed in that previous slide that you had a group of workers there. I noticed a couple of the workers didn't appear to be doing any work. Uh, I think it was all hands. Oh, oh my goodness. Uh, literally. I think it's like Gabriel struck the uh, North Island uh, from the top to the 14th of February this year. Um, and brought significant heavy rain uh, in the range of 220 to 340 millimetres um, across the Kuiper district. Um, in addition to that, we had significant um, uh, wind gusts nearing 50 kilometres an hour, 100 kilometres an hour, uh, resulting in a number of trees uh, coming down and, and uh, closure of roads and power. Um, the photo to my um, uh, left um, is the start of Cyclone Gabriel. You'll see that the um, orange and green represent the actual Cyclone Category 1 and 2. Uh, luckily, it was downgraded uh, to an ex-tropical Cyclone, which is denoted in the blue. But during that 72-hour period, um, that's when the majority of the rainfall fell. And the graph, um, or the picture that you can see, um, essentially, demonstrates the, the uh, amount of water above the, the median rainfall uh, falling um, on the North Island, but in particular around our district um, in, in the Whangarei uh, area. So, you know, we, we're getting up to um, anywhere between 280 to up to 400 uh, millimetres of hour. So a lot of uh, rain in a short uh, period of time. Um, and you can see from the Whangarei weather radar that, you know, over those three days we had um, prolonged and intense rainfall. Similarly, uh, um, you can see that we had uh, significant wind gusts, you know, varying from, uh, you know, 40 kilometres right up to about 100 kilometres per hour. Um, through, through the mirror, just well, the, the graph there showing the path of the cyclone, it, it takes a real Kank, do we know when that was? We can we can time scale that. If you, I, I can go back and um, have a look. Would that time to the lucky break we got on Wednesday afternoon, where it changed? Um, look, it, it's still it, the the thing with the cyclone is it still had a wide path, and so what, whilst we didn't get the eye, you know, we still had the outer edges of it. Um, look, we can actually track the the exact time scale of that um, blue line. Um, and if it helps us in our understanding, then, then we certainly do it. But look, these tropical cyclones move around. They could come down one coast and then, you know, they could swing around and, and, and do another twist in the in the tail. So, Yeah, that, that map's telling, isn't it? Because that's basically the northern wire catchment, except for the little black area around right. It got it all, didn't it? Okay, so look, we've <clears throat> we've done some early work, and I'm going to caveat this by saying this is really early work. Um, you can appreciate that some of the <clears throat> areas we actually haven't been able to <clears throat> um, to get to, um, but we've categorised these in in six distinct areas, as noted in the graph. We put a total cost estimate. Beautiful. Apologies for that. I'm just in the process of getting someone from the office to bring presentations up. Yeah, many of you will have it on your computer as well. That's where I've got it. So. Mine's won't load. Not doing it. Mine took oh, I couldn't give it up either. Oh. Uh, We'll get some problems. I, I couldn't use the I couldn't use the modems in here, and I'll just buy my phone, and it's fine. But... Okay. So look, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, um, so the the table there just expresses um, what we know today in terms of the costs that we're likely to face um, going forward. Now, I do want to caveat to say this is really broad. It's low confidence. Um, and the intent is to refine these figures over time as projects get defined and better cost estimates are put uh, against it. 
The middle column is uh, what Kaipara District Council potentially will face if we don't get any subsidy from Waka Kotahi. And the far right column is what we believe uh, will be the, the subsidy available from Waka Kotahi. Now, there's a moving scale from Waka Kotahi. They go from 62% uh, right up to 85%. Um, they may well consider more given the, the nature of the damage right throughout New Zealand. Um, but for the purposes of this presentation, we've just taken an estimated 70%. Does this include Mangafai on Friday? Or? No. no. So it excludes the event that happened on the 24th. Um, so as you can see, the total cost bill um, is in the range of 22 to 35. Uh, if we get some Waka Kotahi funding, it drops to about 12 to 21. Um, I'm hoping um, through Andy's good work and his team that we can secure more subsidies so that removes the burden on the district. Um, but what we are doing is we know we will be facing a delta. And so we are doing a deep review of our 23, 22, 23, uh, and 23, 24 capital uh, program and, and operational budget. So what that means is that um, where, where it is urgent and we need to do it, we'll need to look at deferral or stopping um, some of our uh, projects to, to reduce the impact to council. Having said all that, we'll, we'll, we'll keep the council updated as we go um, because we might not be able to close the, the, the delta. Uh, we'll certainly aim to do so, but this is just an initial purview of where we stand today. Um, one of the things that I do want to mention is that uh, whilst we are doing resilience planning, uh, you, it must be noted that this was a significant event. I'll, I'll show you the next slide, and it's been prolonged since November. Um, and so, the other cases we might not be able to mitigate the event from um, new infrastructure. So, generally, um, a stormwater system is designed for a one in 10 year every event that goes away. In some cases, they're designed for a 100 year to take the 100 year event away. Um, there's no system that can cater for the events that we've struck over the last um, uh, month. Uh, so, we're not saying that um, we won't be able to solve everything. We're just putting it out there to say that there may be cases where if we do have another event of this nature, uh, we may see the same problems of flooding. Um, what compounds um, Kaipara District Council is that we, the, the Wairoa River and the Kaipara Harbour has a quite a large catchment um, and is denoted in that uh, plan there. So, you know, right up through to uh, Whangarei. So, you know, we, we do have a long um, the drainage uh, time falls on that catchment and everything that falls on the catchment comes towards us. And so um, a large uh, body of water uh, coming towards uh, the Kaipara district. 600 and something thousand hectares. Yeah, uh, it goes from 1971 right through to uh, 22, and, and it's around the November, December 22. You can sort of see that over that period we've had, um, you know, some above normal years. Um, this year, or last year, sorry, uh, we were getting quite close to well above uh, normal. So, exceptional amount of rainfall um, during the back end of, of 2022. Now, those uh, uh, pictures down the bottom, just to represent the amount of rainfall. So if you look at November, now we've got to change our uh, minds to now um, percentage above median, but it, it doesn't really matter in terms of the the, 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 the numbers tell the story. So the dark um, uh, crimson purple uh, is around 400%. Uh, percent. Uh, so it's four times above uh, the median. So quite a lot of dark, quite a lot of dark red in November. So quite a lot of rain. Um, December it eased up a little bit, but still uh, reasonably uh, wet. And then January was really, really wet. So, what this means is that the, the ground is saturated. You know, so by the time you know we came to um, the, the January and the February events, that was just pure runoff. Uh, there was no saturation uh, at all. So, you know, it, it, and, and then the combination of wind uh, just sort of compounded uh, our problems. So these are just some photos, just for uh, example. So we've got, um, you know, uh, the the railway embankment, which in uh, breached, uh, resulting in, in flooding. We've got flooding across Beach Road. 
Um, we were quite lucky in the sense that um, our treatment plant in Dargaville, or the oxidation pond, um, it didn't get a lot of uh, inundation. The maturation pond did, which uh, was unfortunate, but you can sort of see that it's got a, uh, an overland flow path coming towards, um, towards that pond and just the amount of rain um, in that area. Uh, and the valley that that water comes through uh, meant that the maturation ponds um, went under water. Now th those ponds are in recovery state at the moment. They act as a, a polishing, so they don't do primarily the the, the bug eating. The oxidation pond does that. Um, the maturation pond is is really just a polishing pond before we um, irrigate into the into the wetlands. Um, this uh, roading, so the, the picture there just uh, shows you what happened on the day. Really, we had chaos uh, all, over the, all over the show from fallen trees uh, right through to um, slips and uh, washouts, essentially, which uh, yeah, takes the road away. Um, the other uh, uh, issue, the, the picture up the top there, sorry, is uh, the Bailey's Beach um, boardwalk. Um, the Bailey's Beach actually, and Andy can explain it a, a little bit. The Bailey's Beach actually dropped about a meter. The whole, the whole, it carved out about a meter of of sand. So the the armoring that we did worked well, so it protected the road. So the road was uh, intact, um, but it did chisel uh, its way through, you know, the boardwalk. Um, so there's a little bit of work that we're going on at the moment uh, around the stability of that of that boardwalk. And of course, we had um, the event that closed um, the, the surf park. Uh, as part of the, the Civil Defence uh, Act, um, we're now going from um, uh, response into recovery, and, and we have appointed a internal recovery manager. Uh, and uh, the intention is that we'll bring a draft uh, recovery uh, Plan an outline of a recovery plan at the April briefing. Um, in the meantime, she's working collaboratively with the other northern count, uh, councils and, and NRC just to make sure we've got alignment, um, and then overall working internally with the various teams to get a, a good picture on on what our recovery uh, looks like. As I said here before, uh, some of that has already taken place. So the trees have been removed. Uh, roads open, but we've still got roads that are the vulnerable um, uh, to further slippage. Uh, we have set up an internal team um, to look at the lessons learnt, and that's just the best practice um, in terms of um, how we manage our infrastructure. So, as I said to you, we will be coming back uh, to council over the coming months um, as we get better definition, and you know we'll be sharing some of our lessons learnt and building that into our, our strategies. Going forward, Oops. sorry. Yep. So, just in terms of the the next step, um, we are developing um, a recovery management plan. Um, back to council uh, at April briefing, um, but more importantly, we are looking at our uh, current financial year and next financial year's budget um, to see how we can close the the gap as we get more information around. Uh, the, the the cost of Kuiper as a result of the the two events. So I'm not talking about the the two events here in detail. I'm talking about Gabriel. But when we do our review, we'll be bringing in the the February 24th event into our uh, calculation. Um, that's it, uh, Mr. Mayor. I'm happy to take any questions. And Andy's here to. No. Okay, I'll try it open to members who would like to ask any questions. Councillor Aaron Wilson Collins. Thank you. Um, Joy, what a lovely start to the day. Um, I appreciate the comments that you've made that, that there's no infrastructure that can really handle such events that we've seen. Just want to clarify though, the, the, the idea of, of the um, the idea of, of, of the resilience planning, is that to at least to make sure that the infrastructure we do have is working and because and, there's been a lot of stories circulating of Blocked culverts, concreted and floodgates, and, and I don't know if they believe you're out finding out if that's the case. That's the case. Yeah, and um, that is the case. It's the case in the one that you sent me in terms of the, the Campbell uh, River. Has been concreted on. It's it, it's been blocked. Oh dear, um, but yeah. So so the idea is that we'll get everything actually 
working to its full potential, at least. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to clarify that. And so, some of the resilience planning is that we might have to increase the, the water height of our maturation pond, for example. <coughs> but we can't stop all that water coming down. No. Certainly protect our infrastructure. Yeah. It's our ability to. Yeah. No, I appreciate. I appreciate that. Mm. Thank you. Councillor Howard, you have your hand up. Um, I do. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor, and, and thank you, Arnon, for your presentation. Um, I've got, a, I guess, a high-level question. Um, a lot of councils around the country have had ongoing sufferings from uh, such uh, events uh, seemingly on an ongoing basis. I never hear about the fact that they are necessarily broke um as, as a result of these events and re the repairs and remediation how do councils generally go about funding this uh, this sort of work that is required i mean obviously even if it was 12 to 15 million dollars uh, that we had to front up with net um and it'll be more uh, after you take into account uh, last friday um how do how do councils generally fund all that? Is it just by debt, or is it reallocation of budgets? Um, just a general overview, there, please. Well, it might be two. Yes. Yeah, so. so the I mean, the first point of call for roading infrastructure is Waka Kotahi. They have, they have yep. uh, quite a few uh, strands of of funding. Um, so from a roading perspective, that would be the first uh, tranche. From a water, wastewater, stormwater infrastructure, I mean, again, we'll be looking to government. They do have some funding um, around resilience planning, um, climate change impact is, is how they've defined it. So we would certainly, and we currently will be, looking to tap into um, that fund as well. And then when it comes to water, uh, stormwater, uh, sorry, water, wastewater, um, probably very little uh, funding um, opportunities there. So we would have to do one of two things, review our program and see what we can defer or stop. Um, and if the, the, you know, if we've gone too far down the program and a lot of it has been committed, then we'll certainly be coming back to council to say we may need to uh, borrow more or there may be other avenues that Sue's got within her armour uh, to release them. So, okay. so just to add to that, um, we'll be really interested in what the um, FAR rate is from um, Waka Kotahi, um, and then that will then tell us what our share we'll, we'll have to fund, and that's normally out of general rates, but we may decide on some other funding. Um, and as well as that, what we're doing is we're just starting under the recovery manager to set up a team to look at um, what we can claim on insurance, because some of it may be able to be claimed on insurance, and then civil defence do have some things that they ca that you can claim under as well for some of your um, infrastructure, uh, not related to roads. They they basically don't have anything there, but there is some that might be pump stations that are flooded and can't be used again, and we may be able to. They'll pay up to civil defence. Um, have said that they pay up to 60%, but the proof is in the pudding when you put your claim in and see if they approve it. Thank you, Sue. Um, any further questions? Your Worship, uh, Councillor Lambert. Sorry, Councillor Lambert. Thanks, through, through the mayor. I'm um, following on from that and just to Sue and the Smith Canal area down rural way and, and the, the failure of the floodgates here or the pumps here and inundation of salt water. Um, was that a failure of a system down there? And would those farmers be eligible to look at some sort of insurance to get rid of the, the salination of their land or? Yeah. Is that, is that what happened or? Yeah, look, I'll need to come back to your council with the, the specifics of what actually happened. Um, we, we're in an intelligent gathering phase at the moment. So yeah. There's a lot of uh, intelligence coming in, and we just need to start to partition in the, in the categories that we had out there. Um, so we'll come back to you with, with what actually happened there and what are the consequences and what can we do to prevent that from happening. Well, the local councillors might have more knowledge. <laughs> Councillor Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, well, actually, if, if you would allow me to, to share from having spoken with the chairman of the Raupo Drainage Committee. Um, seems there's been a, there was a bit of a comms problem in that previously, oh, sorry, the, 
is the Wallace Road um, flood pump couldn't be activated because the power supply, which was coming off the 11 kV line, had the 33 kV line lying on it. So until that was cleared away, the, they couldn't activate the pump. And um, he told me that previously there'd been a, a good understanding from the personnel at, at North Power that it was a piece of critical infrastructure that needed to be um, treated as a priority. Um, and perhaps through personnel changes or whatever, that message hadn't been kept front of mind. So there was a delay for several days, I think, before it was possible to get that line up and running and enable the flood pump to be engaged. So that was possible uh, a contributing factor. Councillor Manderson. Uh, through you, Mr Mayor, I had a property that bounded the northern Wairau River and the back part of the farm uh, almost permanently was subject to inundation from the, wire, from the northern Wairau, admittedly at a point in which the salt content wasn't that high, but it made very little difference there at that salt content to the pasture composition. So a casual flooding with that sort of seawater is in my opinion, not likely to be of any significance, but if it was to continue, it could be. Further questions? I'd just like to ask a couple. Um, so you've separated out the, the estimated costs. Um, so when you look at the land drainage and um, Stormwater and water supply. None of them are, but most of them aren't linked to roading. They are separate issues, right? Yeah. Which is the most significant in your view, Emma? Roading. Roading. The roading. roading. Yeah, but of the other ones, what's the most significant? Proceeding. Of the other ones, which is the most significant? Uh, so, in terms of the, the wastewater, um, obviously we've had our, flood, our pups um, under water at the treatment plant here, so mm -hmm. we've got to get those um, up and running. Um, some of our electricals, uh, we've got them started, but some of our electrical uh, components need to be upgraded. Um, some of our comms at the pump stations need to be upgraded so that they can continue to talk to us. That's in the, in, the, in the wastewater. Water supply was actually really resilient. I must have to, you know, we can put our, we can hang, hold our heads high when it comes to water. So all our plants performed really well. Uh, we had high turbidity, which is sediment in the water, but the treatment plants we were able to manage that turbidity and continue to provide um, water. Uh, Railway uh, treatment plant continued, uh, although the, the roof got damaged. Um, it is an old roof and it got further damaged, which also took out. Uh, some communication. Um, uh, so our, our priority is just in the water supply, just for Ruai, but that's not a, a big, a big fix. New roof and some more componentry. Um, stormwater is we're going to have to take a real hard look at stormwater because that's that's just a lot of water falling on um, on, on our area, but was it as a consequence of blocked um, and, and sealed over culverts, or you know, was it just? Everything functioned fine, but it's just the sheer volume. So that, that's just a, a work in progress that we, we are doing. And land drainage, we just need to take a little bit of a, a look and do a bit more resilience uh, around that. So we, we know we've got areas that we've breached um, that we have to work with Kiwi Rail. Uh, we've got some areas in Takupuru where the swelling of the river um, overtopped. So we might have to look at you know, some further bank uh, improvements. And then we've got the roading, um, Mr. Mayor. That, that, um, you know the, the pictures are, are there that self self tell the story by himself. So overall, it, it's it's across the board. But um, mm -hmm. I would say that um, if it was in terms of priority, it'd be roading, um, land drainage, um, the wastewater, uh, and then the and then the water supply, and then obviously we've got the community facilities, which you know we just have to uh, put into another category. Yep, Councillor Howard. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, and just uh, following on from that, um, and, and I guess it's a matter of, of, of having the, the correct narrative here. Um, you talked about the land, the land drainage, and and um, really stormwater. And we know of instances over this side where water is ponded in, in two or three areas at huge volumes, um, and and the 
the consensus seems to be that largely due to um, drainage being or stormwater being done on the basis of soakholes, sand-based soakholes, rather than piped drainage. Yet I did read somewhere in, in um, the documents for today that over here we had 24 kilometres of piped stormwater drainage. Um, is it correct that we do have uh, subdivisions over this side uh, that are almost totally based on soakage holes for drainage? Um, look, I'll, I'll need to come back, uh, Councillor Howard. I know individual properties in some cases there are. I would expect that a subdivision uh, would need to go to a pipe system. So the MetLife Care, for example, is a, a classic example where they are in discussions with us about putting a reticulation through their uh, subdivision and, and taking it to a pond and then out, out to the, the estuary. So um, if there are any specifics, I'm happy to look into those. But generally, I would say the volume of water, depending on the nature of the subdivision, would need to go to a primary pipe system. Uh, th thanks, Anand. I Look, the, the first instance is the sands um, uh, subdivision, which is... Um, uh, the entry is Sail Rock Drive, uh, which you know we've we've had the team pump out over a million liters uh, there because it was just impossible to go anywhere. So that's that's one of the ones that I'm thinking about particularly. I mean, we we, we obviously have a uh, a similar situation uh, in uh, Mangafai Park behind uh, the fire station and Maz. Um, yeah. The water just can't go anywhere. So I I, I mean, it's just a matter of. Um, has has it been the strategy in past to use soak holes um, instead of uh, a a more permanent um, drainage strategy of piping? Yeah, so um, we do encourage blue green infrastructure. So you know, doing as much retention on site as you can. Um, but at the end of the day, the the, the the amount of retention you can do is is fine by the site coverage that you can you can do it over, um, and, and it'll be a combination of on site uh, storage, on site treatment, on site disposal, um, and then uh, a mechanism to allow any surplus to go over into a, into a pipe uh, network. Yep. Okay, thank you. So and through the chair, what I can confirm is that we are looking at how um, we dispose of the water through cell rock um, because with the MetLife here, the owning the land, we can, um, you know, there's room for negotiation that we can actually build a pipe that goes through um, their land. So we will right. be looking at it. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thanks. Um, the, the other learning chair asked a question around uh, wastewater was our Mungafai treatment plant. Um, so obviously, you know, on the 24th, we saw that event inundate the pond, but also pump quite a bit of flow. Um, <laughs> but what we've also um, noted is that if we do have a, a prolonged power outage, that we've got some generator capacity issues. Um, so we are looking at building more resilience in our generators so that if for example, the power outage was prolonged. Our treatment plant is uh, still protected. Councillor Vincent. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, our question probably more for Sue. I'm just wondering, like, where I think I have been the last year or two regarded as middle of the pack in terms of our debt in relation to turnover and whatever the other um, measures are. Um, how much headroom do we have for taking on more debt and still? be a prudent council? Um, so through the chair, uh, we've got plenty of room um, and we can, I think we can go up to something like about 80 million um, and still be within our debt ratios that LGFA and um, and, and our other banking um, people require and our treasury policy. However, um, the council actually made a decision that they didn't want the council debt to go over 60 million. So when you look at um, what's going to be happening, some of the projects that we're funding through debt um, over the next two years, that will change 
um, our debt levels quite significantly because we're spending our own money, not other people's. Because you'll re uh, recall that we have had something like about $35 million come in from MB or DIA or, or wherever um, on specific projects. And so for the past two years, our debt hasn't moved, but it soon will do because those projects are coming to an end and we're starting to look at projects that um, we have to fund ourselves. Okay, so perhaps we could pass another resolution as a council not to have any more cyclones. Ah. <laughs> Through you, Chair, um, Andy's here to answer any questions around the voting. Yes, I was just going to move on to, to, <clears throat> to give us a review of the state of things out there, Andy, please. Yeah, um, through, through you, Mr Mayor. Up until Friday, we had about a thousand faults on the roading network. I think as of yesterday morning before I headed to Poto to meet with the community there, we were at about 1100 faults and counting. Um, anywhere from a small slip that's come down off the hillside over the road to a uh, underslip or, or like Kaiwaka Mangapai Road where the road's fallen away and we've lost connectivity into Mangapai. We have taken the approach that we're prioritising in and out of Northland. So Kawaka Mangafai Road and, and the likes needs some resilience built back into it ASAP to make sure that we aren't cut off completely from the world like we were when we had the COVID lockdowns. Um, I appreciate that there are lots of roads out there that are important to our individual people and individual communities, but I think when you look at it at a network level from a Northland perspective, we, we just need to be prudent and ensure that we remain connected to move goods and freight in and out of here. And, and we've got, I think, spent here plus every single subcontractor we can get our hands on working on things at the moment, basically. Sorry, Mr. Beard, can I just ask Andy, so is Cove Road uh, likely to be open today? Reluctantly, yes. Um, we, we would have liked to have tried to remain closed on Cove Road until the weekend so that it enabled our teams to be a bit more productive through there. When they have to set up the likes of stop-go operations, it makes it a little less productive because they are really constrained down to a singular lane for manoeuvring big vehicles around. Um, but we do appreciate that the local industries here are screaming out to get goods in and out of Mungify from that end of the network and the okay. detour is a significant detour. When that bridge is open, we're going to have another scenario where only north traffic goes over the Bridge Dunes, and then probably a heap of them are going to want to come back through Cove Road. Not sure yet. Bernard Peterson's assessing that at the moment, and we've just got um, our structural engineers going to look at the bridge and make sure that the repair works that we've done is suitable for heavy goods vehicles and stuff before we make a decision on how we operate that. Speed restriction. Yep. Um, Papara Oakley, we've put a speed restriction on there to try and make it safer and try and slow down some of the distress that the heavies are causing. Um, Cove Road is already 60k an hour, so there should, if we need to continue work, there should just be temporary traffic management under stop go, which requires the 30k an hour around the work sites. So essentially, a lot of our roads that we pay for are being pounded because we're contributing to getting traffic through to the north to other districts. Yeah, so it's unavoidable, I know, but correct. Co co it's causing, in your estimate, the, the, the extra traffic's causing how much more effect on those roads? Like Oakley? I don't know. Over eight, just don't know. It's something that we need to quantify and discuss with NZTA or Katahi because, again, I, I heard on the way here this morning on the radio that the Brindewins was open and now it's closed again because another slip's come down with the traffication on it. So we're, yeah. again, so. Kaipara District is a, is a real critical link into Northland. You know, we, we own two of the major roads that get people in and out of here. One of them is okay for freight to a certain extent. The other one, um, once you cross into the WDC boundary, the corners are just too sharp to get B trains and things like that through. So yeah. uh, working on a bit of a strategy around that at the moment, Anand and I are. Well, I think you've identified a, a good argument for further funding for this district for rating that because of the of the um, you know, the burden we're carrying. Ten years ago, Waka Katahi did the PVC Northland to Auckland, which talks about all the various options, the four laning options, the upgrade options, and Kawaka Mangafai Road and up and over Cove Road is seen as one of the preferred options for state highway trans, um, traffic detours. 
and and so we've for me personally with the work I'm doing in the LTP have been focusing my energy and efforts around our business cases to try and justify that investment in our network to improve those routes mm. and, and and aligning that with what what Kate's own business case is and I think what we've seen <coughs> last year and and through and continuing through into this year particularly the heavy rain event last Friday is that those routes are critical to people in Northland, not just Kaipara, and, and we need to be building full resilience into those routes so that when the proverbial hits the storm, we, we are okay, that we're not, we're not severed from the rest of the world, that we can continue people getting to school and, and people going to work and all of those things. And I think that what we've seen helps us justify that to the government for that investment, in my mind. As, as your asset manager for roading. Thank you, Councillor Howard. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Andy, thank you very much for that. Actually, uh, as it transpired, you pretty much answered what I wanted to do, uh, what I wanted to do, ask. But uh, I mean, I think that all we can do is encourage. Uh, you know, we are uh, the default um, uh, tra tra transport option for um, all sorts of freight um, to keep Northland going. And uh, all we can do is ask you guys to put every ounce of the blowtorch on NZTA um, to upgrade, whether it's funding, whether it's contribution or whatever, to make our roads resilient. Because in all honesty, Cove Road, you know, they put another 100 big double axle units through there again and, and it, it'll be out again. In, in a week, um, you know, it's just so vulnerable at the moment and uh, it is just not fit for purpose. That's the travesty. Thank you, Andy. If I may, Councillor uh, Vincent, I'm oh, sorry. Did you want to respond, Andy? Yeah, I was going to say, if I may, through the Mayor, though, but my, my one comment that I would like to make, and I, I would really like to seek the support of this team, the governance team, that when the government sends out things like essential travel notices only, and we put restrictions to Section 88 on Papara, Oakley, and, uh, or sorry, on Cove Road and that, that, that message needs to go out to our communities that you people need to behave because you're costing our communities money. Like that these, these trucks getting stuck, are meaning mum and dad can't go and pick their kids up from school, and, and, that, and that's a behavioural thing. That's our communities need to play the game with us because we are not able to, to implement the fixes that it needs to, to do the right thing. I think that, that's where this team's support and what is well and truly needed. So Andy and I are working on a strategy in terms of <coughs> uh, restricting um, heavy vehicles into both those main links. So uh, again, we'll, we'll inform the council once we have a, uh, a better understanding of what we can do. Councillor Vincent. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, I've, I wrote down, I think it's a recent movie, isn't there? Everything, everywhere, all the time. And that, that's basically what you've been, been faced with. Um, I, I do wonder, though, in terms of um, making, and I didn't um, have this idea, it was a, a rate pay, I had this idea of who lives on the Papara Oakley of uh, putting a uh, traffic counter on the road. So we actually got some hard data to support our, our claim, and I guess, and Cove Road when it opens as well. Um, and um, yeah, and I really hope that the, the it's open as you're hoping. Thank you. Before we move on, I have one more question. From Mr. And it follows on from that. Um, I, I know you're looking after Kuiper Roads, but I believe your NTA does look after the state highways. Oh. I've grave concerns for State Highway 12 and 14. Um, we know those spots in State Highway 12 um, around the Pepero area. Um, there's a few little problems in the rural wide flats, but um, State 14 at Tangataroya, it is a moving target all the time. It's continually slipping. I see weekly repairs there, and it's just um, we've got driver behaviour. Um, how are they two holding up, and are you monitoring it, or have you solely left it for the highways? Yes, yeah, so through the mayor, the, the NTA, even though we work collaboratively with NZTA, we don't have any say in what the state highway maintenance is. We don't look after the state highways at all. Um, they have the network outcomes contract, the NOP contract, which is run by Fulton Hogan, and they have their own internal management team and things like that. So they work very similarly to we do, as we do. 
um, and, and we can offer them advice and accept advice from them. They can't intervene in their maintenance plan. But I agree with you, State Highway 14 is a mixed piece, especially just the other side of Tangata Roria. Um, yeah. So just a supplementary question to that, um, by them putting out notices, no heavy traffic on these roads, and, and you reinforcing that, when a truck does go through there, uh, in defiance of that, that directive or that advisory note, um, would the insurance be under threat and... and is it? I can't answer that. All I can answer is that with the work that Anna and I are looking at, it could reinforce the Section 88 that they issued through civil defence on Cove Road, which then makes that restriction enforceable. Mm. But I, I appreciate it's a long way round from 12 to 14 to get to Whangarei, but mm. yes, it's a long way round, but is it worth killing someone over taking the shortcut and breaking the that's my sort of view of the world is no, it's not. And actually, sorry, Mr. Truck Driver, but you're going to have to drive that way. And I think this is the message that the elected members, the, the governance teams of our councils need to be selling to our businesses and our communities is, look, we appreciate it, but just please play the game for the short period of time until we understand it. I mean, we, we don't know the extent of all of the defects yet. You know, we've been in this immediate response phase, picking up trees and, and Trying to put out TT ran out of signs. That's how bad it is. Um, so we don't know the extent of the failure. What would happen if someone drove that route and they weren't supposed to, and we've restricted it for a reason and it collapsed? Who, who would then be responsible? Yeah, I don't think it would be us as a council because we've done everything we can. But under workplace health and safety law, the, the operators of those companies become PCBUs, and they should be being responsible as a PCBU to ensure that their staff and every single person in the public is safe from their actions. But Pepper Road, Oakley Road, how much is ours? All the bad bits on the ridges and falling away. You must... Up over Franklin Road, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, about half of it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Look, um, time's moving on. I'm conscious of that. It's after 10.30, so I invite members to send email questions to Anne and Andy if you want any further answers taken. Um, so we'll move on. Thank you, Steve Andy. So we'll move on to um, Sue Davidson on the annual plan. Okay. Um, kia ora, councillors. Um, can you see me? Because I'm not sure if I've got my video on. No, we can't. Can hear you. Okay. You might, yeah, I'm not sure that I... Um, it says, it says I've got my video on, but I'm just not sure what's happened. Okay, so you can hear me, that's good. Um, right, annual plan. Um, if you go to the next slide, and we'll stay on the slide for a while, um, then you can see here that um, from what Arnon said, the um, annual plan is a moving feast and it won't remain static. So we, every time we think we've nailed it, um, it starts moving again. Um, so I, I just wanted to go back and then over our journey. So we started at the December meeting, um, we were 5.73% um, as the total rates, that was general rates plus targeted rates and the water, the movement in the water, which is um, paid by a cubic litre, is um, had obviously gone, the costs had gone down. So we put in, we had a big discussion at our last briefing about some of the items that you wanted to put in, um, you know, provision for economic development. Um, we talked about the fact that we needed to raise more debt for the Mungatoroto sand filter, that um, we'd got a subsidy for Dargaville cycling path, and that we had, uh, we were, we'd look to take the POTO second seal, and rather than paying that totally by general rates, we'd actually um, fund that by debt, which was more appropriate for that road. And um, we also, but then subsequent to that, we also had uh, two of our areas ask for more for more money, and that was parks, and that was because of the increase in the toilets um, and on parks, and also some extra park expenditure, and also land drainage. So that put um, that was increasing the rates over and above our discussion last time. Um, and then we looked at some of the 
other areas that council could decrease, look at decreasing, which was um, listed on my page two, which was basically about art strategy activation, a papara wastewater design, Dargaville infiltration, Mungafai stormwater, Bailey's beach stormwater, and Dargaville wastewater. And Arnon had a good uh, look at that and um, put his hand up and said, look, I can cut that by 150. So at that stage, we thought, um, this is good. We've got the rates, uh, actually below, we were, we'd got the rates to, um, reasonably below 5%. Um, but then um, after discussions with the chairman of the Raupo drainage, uh, he, with with the um, the approval of his committee and people in the, in the Raupo district, wanted to keep the rates for Raupo so that there was a reserve. And so he wanted to put up the target at all, the targeted rates for 200 by 200,000 so that um, they had a reserve in the Raupo reserve account. So that affects the targeted rates and that's voluntary. So that looks like where we are now would be 5.46%, um, which would be made up of your general rates would be under 5%, but your targeted rates would be a lot more, um, more than the 6.9. It's probably. Can I jump in there, sir? Yep, you can. Can I jump in, jump in there, sir? With the um, Raupo land, land drainage targeted rate, how many people would that be spread over? I think that's uh, Raupo area has about 250 people. And they're happy with that. So that's, you know, I've checked um, that and, and uh, yeah. And, and what he said was that they wanted it, they'd increased it last minute in last year's budget and he wanted to keep it at that level, whereas we had it at a level that was provided for in the long-term plan and hadn't been updated for last year's increase. So, um, so they're wanting to keep that. So what I'm saying to you now is right. it looks like for general and targeted rates of wastewater and stormwater, we will be slightly over the 5.46%, but that um, general rates will be under the 5%. Um, on average, and obviously there's a reduction in water movement. Um, so the message is, this is where we are now, but you've heard Arnon's um, report on our infrastructure. We need to understand what emergency works we're going to have to undertake. Um, some will be absorbed this year, some might fall into next year. And we're, um, yeah, so that's that's going to affect us going forward. So I think all I'm doing is telling you about the journey we're on. And I thought we'd sort of um, got there, but because of the, the events, things are going to change again. So I'm going to have to come back to you, um, likely April, potentially, it could be as late as May, when we've um, to talk about the rates again. So that's, um, I suppose the the message at the moment because we don't understand exactly what the costs are going to be that we're going to have to fund this in this year or in next year. So, is there any questions on that? And and just to if you go to the next page, um, Alana. So we still have some options, although they're not very much, <laughs> which um, we could uh, reduce funding of depreciation and defer the Mungify taking the last bit of the Mungify wastewater um, depreciation, which would be 220,000, or we could look at decreasing levels of service, or we go back and look at some of our um, costs and say, are these priority or not, and reprioritize. So there is, but at the moment, until we actually know what our increase in cost is going to be from these events, um, I don't think we can go any further mm. on that particular, on the, on the rates. So um, I think, if there's no question just on the rates, we can go on to the water. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll dive in there. But, uh, Mike Howard, you have a question? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Sue. Um, yes, it is a, a, a real tightrope that you've got, and you, you, you find um, you, you, you're sort of walking there. Uh, two, two quick observations. Should we be talking about uh, when we're talking percentage increases, should we be the, our narrative just be on the general rates increase because targeted 
uh, as we just heard, for as, as few as 250 people, um, and, and, and they're under separate negotiation or discussion. Um, and, and there are other, obviously other elements of that. So, I mean, I, I, it's just a thought, should we only be talking about the general rate increase um, w with a note that uh, in some areas um, that there will be increase for, for targeted rates. The other aspect is, I would hate, <clears throat> I know that we have, you know, ideally aiming at the 5% and, and, you know, hopefully we can do that still. However, I just think that as a council, we have, we've got two positions for our feet. One is to be uh, providing um, uh, our ratepayers with the, the best possible or the lowest possible rate increase um, that we can. But at the same time, as we're seeing, we can't go mealy mouthed about, you know, stopping expenditure when we have a sense that it is going to have a long-term impact that could be way more uh, negative to the future um, uh, financial viability or, or, or uh, performance of the council. So, I mean, I, I think that in here that we've probably got, and, and there is an easy, well, a, a relatively easy discussion to be had with the community on that, where we are trying to future-proof things. And so, I, I mean, I don't know how other other councillors feel, but I, I do feel that we need to ensure that there is a realistic level of future-proofing covered each year um, in our in our budgeting. Uh, so through the chair, thanks, Mike, for your observation. Spoken like a true media person, yes, you. Um, we can just say the general rates are under five percent. So you can select what you want as a council. Really, there's no one that tells us what what how we um, can express it to the public. Um, but in this particular case, the targeted rates people have actually, well, through um, the land drainage, have actually want want a, a bigger targeted rate so that they've got yep. money there to prepare for another event. So that certainly is an option um, when we go out to the public um, and, and just with the, with the right explanation. Um, and then obviously that's what we will be looking at going forward is um, you haven't seen the costs we're about to give them to you. I'm, I'm just waiting. Every time I think I'm going to get information, an event happens. So it's, um, it's, but we are just about to give you the information on where we are as a council and we are doing well with our operating expenses. expenses as I um, explained to you, we're about 900,000 under budget because of salaries and also finance charges that we've been able to um, avoid because we haven't had the capital expenditure that's and, and raised debt that we thought we would. Um, in terms of our capital, we've only to date um, been able to do to the end of January uh, complete 27 million of our 68 million budget. So we have to really look at what can we actually complete going forward and also then what's now come on top of us. And, and we were in the middle of that. And, but now what's come on top of us as a result of the, um, these, these latest events. Um, and we'll obviously be looking at, um, you know, looking at what's realistic that we can do and what do we need to do and reprioritizing because some of the things that we thought we might have to do, we might just have to pull out. So I think we, we've, we've sort of had a, we've got a starting point of where we are, you know, we were up to, it is going to change, but there's obviously a lot of work that Arnon, um, myself and the, um, the rest of the ET team will have to do to um, look at going forward and then bring back to you. Um, but there are, st yeah, so that's, that's where we're at. And, and But there are some still some guidance I need from you today, but before I move on to the next subject, which is water rates, then I'd like to be able to, um, yeah, if there's any other questions, just on the, the rates themselves, and otherwise we That's can go to this. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I, um, I think that, um, just make a statement first, I think to future-proof our budget, I think we do need to fully fund depreciation so that we can ensure that the assets we've got continue to perform as they should perform. 
And I think that would come at the expense of new capital projects where we have to make that choice. But the other option to that is um, increasing our borrowing, which means increased debt servicing. So how far can we go with um, an increased cost of debt servicing without having to regard it as significant, whereby we should be consulting with our community? Um, that's what I'll have to um, look at as a, as a result of what, um, what, claim, what grants are available that we can claim to see what's actually outstanding. So, and I, um, I'm, yeah, that's a different question. Do we now have to go back out to our community? And we can't answer that till we know the extent of the gap um, that we're going to have and whether we go out to our community. But you're right that um, this, these new events may well trigger um, significance. Although, look, this is just business as usual for us. And what question would we ask people to go out to? Do you think we should uh, fix our stuff or not? <laughs> you know, <laughs> so you've got to think about what question you're going to ask. So the reality is we might not be, even have to go out to um, uh, well, we just, we just the have question to might, be, might be though, do we increase your rates this year by 20% or do we borrow to cover, uh, say, operational type costs or our um, depreciation shortfall, say, for instance? Yeah, so I think what we need to do, because you you're jumping ahead, we need to understand the gap and then I can look at the scenarios. But thank you for your input. Um, understand that you want us to look at a number of different things. Councillor Aaron Wilson Collins. Um, I just want to reiterate um, in total call what Councillor Vincent has said about fully funding depreciation. I think that is really important long term. Um, but also the other option up on the screen at the moment um, to decrease level of service. I don't understand how that's not already going to happen because our rates increase is nowhere near the level of inflation. So um, to decrease level of service even further might be very tricky. Um, however, and saying all that, that it's all going to depend on what you can come back with, because obviously there's so much research and, and um, items we put together with with actually what needs to be done in our district. And I think this is going to be absolutely an extraordinary annual plan that we're going to be dealing with, and we're going to be juggling a lot to because the the, the emergency repairs are, are going to have to take precedence. So I, I just yeah, looking forward to. Well, I'm not looking forward to it, but <laughs> we obviously can't discuss much today. It's obviously a discussion for another day when you've got all your information together. That's right, yeah, and you are correct, Councillor um, uh, um, Collins. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, um, uh, that the decrease in level of service has occurred with roading, and roading advised us of that when um, last year because of the the huge increase. That there's already a gap with what we. Um, had started with to a year ago to what we can expect over the next few years, although we won't see it happening just in one particular year. Um, but our other contracts we have recently negotiated, and um, so that's the what water and wastewater only in the last year. So the, there shouldn't be too large decreases in level of, of service. I mean, I think that's pretty. I think they 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 will be able to be met. Oh. Through you, Mr. Mayor, if I can. So I just, I just before we move on to Sue wants to move on to the water side of things. I think, uh, look, you're getting a picture today with these first two items uh, about the need to adjust due to these emergency works, and we obviously need to do a lot, a lot more work to try and get some certainty for you. Uh, and the team are going to work hard to do that. But you know, obviously, we're going to run out of time as far as consultation goes too. Um, and you know, I think the, the question that Sue said about what question would you ask is actually really relevant here, because you know, there's no point asking a question that you're going to get the answer to that you know what it's going to be, right? So we'll take you through that journey to make sure that you're you're cool on the process and where we're going. Um, but we're going to need to make some decisions relatively quickly, I think, based on the information we can get for you. Um, so we'll, we'll do our best um, there. Just wanted to let you know, and, and perhaps Sue, maybe if you head over to the water side of things now. Okay, so um, on the water chart, I'm hoping that um, my fellow rating revenue manager um, 
Christine Toms joins us because she will have more details if you start getting into complex questions. But basically, um, we want, we're not changing the revenue and financing policy, but these are decisions that you can make. And I know I had Councillor Lambeth and um, Councillor Pera um, asking me about the fixed charge for water. So we've so what this shows you is the current year is the 22-23 year, which um, by all accounts is, is really hard on people, renters or um, older people, single people in, in residences. So scenario A is actually less. So that's going to be what we're proposing at the moment is scenario A. And that's um, less because obviously we've reduced our costs in water. So, um, do you, and you can see that because the first char then the the charge the first charge of cubic meters if we charge twenty five percent of the cost is from three hundred and seventy three going down to three fifty one. Now what we've given you is scenario B and scenario C if we reduce them further so that um, there are impacts to other ratepayers. So if we do reduce the cost down to fifteen percent to $210 for the first metre charge, then what will happen is you can see our highest users and, and um, what our revenue managers put down here is the impact on, on various households. But you can see the household definitely goes down because they're not paying as much, but our biggest users, so the highest user of 41 cubes is um, no surprise is Silver Farms their bill would go up from 165 to 186,000. The second highest users, um, that is actually the Dargaville pool, would go up from 56 to 63. Um, and the next highest users, which are farmers, um, 44 to 50. So you can see the impact. So I need guidance from you. Do you want us to reduce the, um, the fee, the one-off fee, because I know um, you were hot about it um, at one at the point when we charged it because we charge it in one charge. Um, and, and do you have any other questions for us? And I'm hoping that Christine's online. I'm here. She's a, she's live in person. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> uh, Councillor Lambeth. Yeah, for the mayor. Thanks. So. Um, yeah, my, my concern was that we had um, the council had incurred a lot of unpaid debt due to this these water rates because it, there was that squabble between landlords and tenants and and other people who couldn't couldn't afford to pay it at, as a one lump sum. That that was the the major concern. Um, when we have a look at something like um, the meatworks. Um, yeah, it, it could be the straw that breaks the camel's back for the meat works. I, I know that it takes them nothing to transport the, the stock down to one of their other plants. So, we've, yeah, it's a fine balancing act. And I'm, I'm just wondering whether um, the softening of the impact rather than a one lump sum bill is, is the means to go. And yes, you'd like to reply to that. Um, yeah, okay. Christine, that would be doable. Uh, that's, I, I think. Um, I don't understand what the question was. Sorry, I thought you were making a statement. Oh. No, no, <laughs> yeah. no. It, it, it was. Is there a is there a drip feed process through the year rather than one lump sum? Oh. Because it, it's impacting tenants and landlords, and landlords are blaming tenants, and tenants are blaming landlords, and that squabbling period. We're not getting our water rates paid. Are you proposing potentially splitting the um, charge instead of putting it all onto one invoice to split it in half and put it onto them both because we invoice twice a year? Would that be the for people who are renting and drip feeding in, um, rather than looking at a yearly um, balancing sheet, that would be far easier for them all. We'd need to do it across the whole board so everybody would be treated the same. So yeah, yeah we would. That's it's doable though. Yeah. yeah, that can be done. Is there, Are there any, any other guidance that we've got from Council? Councillor Vincent. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just to clarify, so there's only it's only billed twice a year? Yeah. That's a bit of a problem. How much extra cost would be involved in, say, doubling the frequency and then spreading the bill 
I mean, ultimately, I think as I put forward in my suggestion and feedback um, a couple of days ago was the idea of do it like the, um, you get your power bill, that there's a line charge and then there's a user charge. And if that could be replicated, um, water, then that might be a satisfactory solution, but I'm just not too sure what the overhead implications are. So when we send out rates and voices, the postage on those, but we're talking 15,000, um, is significant. It's $20,000, um, but we are only looking at 3,000, 3,500 water meters across the district. So the costs, of course, are going to be less than that. Uh, um, but also what would happen is that there's a cost of reading the meters because they're not remote, they're not read remotely. Someone uh, we have someone walking around, so there'd be the extra cost of that. So I think it probably outweigh um, at the moment, but we could certainly have a look at those costs as well. Okay. Yeah. Um, Councillor Lamb, what are our outstanding water rates? Are they still looking bad of non-payment? Uh, I've got some information here. Excuse me. So going to the audit and risk report uh, meeting in a couple of weeks, we have a water debt. I can find it. No pressure. Okay. We report that through to um, audit and risk, so it can be discussed there, Gordon. Um, yeah. yeah. So, so is there strong evidence that if you drip feed, make it available for people to drip feed these payments, that you get a higher uptake of people paying? Do you want me to answer that? Yeah, I do. You're, you're the debt in charge of debtors. Yep. Uh, so currently we let people, we go, we, we, we work with people to do payment plans anyway. So we do have a number of people that are paying it off. They show as a debt at the moment. And um, we do try and determine in our um, reporting how many people are sitting in that space, but we're open to people paying them off over the year anyway. So we don't necessarily need to invoice them more often. We just need to pop them onto payment plans potentially. And if they don't pay, is there a penalty fee in there? There is a penalty fee. Yes, we look at. We've got a quite a. Um, You've got quite a flexible. Quite flexible. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Councillor Aaron Wilson Collins. Thank you. Um, I hello, Christine. Um, I sent some questions. Did. Well, do you have any answers for me? Yes. So I did do some modelling on a. Um, you asked for a one person. I've printed out some here. Take one and pass them along. There's three of them there, sorry. And there's three. And then I won't have them back. But that just gives you the scenario of what would be. So I think what, what um, Christine's showing you is for the single user, is that right, Christine? Yes, that's right. Yeah, I've assumed um, a usage of around 75 cubic metres. Um, so you can see the scenarios, the impact of the different scenarios on that. Um, in red, it's an addition to people. Um, I've also done a bit further analysis asked for, um, just to give you a feel. We've got 3,000, so 3,000 of our meters use less than 300 cubic meters per year. So the majority of our water meter properties are actually in the lower usage. 350 meters sit between the 300 and 900 usage, and then we've got more than um, about 90 that sit at using more than a thousand cubic meters. So it's definitely, yeah, if you look at the numbers, we have a lot more um, lower users than, than the higher users. Yeah. So the issue for the fixed cost, um, you know, for the for charging of the first cubic meter charge that everyone gets, and it's the same amount, is because there are fixed costs. Obviously, we put the reticulation network um, and the treatment plant. And we have, um, you know, we, we so that's why we have a fixed cost to everyone, so that they pay a, they they pay a contribution towards um, those annual costs. Also, so they're, so they're in the ground if they want to use them, which is you know how they use them yeah. by turning the tap on. 
Um, can I just add to that? Sorry, I'll just add to that. Um, the more variable your costs, the less certainty you have of your income. And we've got fixed income, which is I think, um, which is what I think Sue just said. Right. Got another beautiful answer for you too. Yeah. 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 Yep. Um, so, um, Councillor Erin had asked what other councils do. So we've done a quick look at those because we don't have a lot of time. Um, Far North have a fixed rate. They don't, they're not equalised. So their rates, they charge between $183 and $500 for a fixed and um, $3.87 for their water per cubic metre after that. Um, Bongarei do have a targeted rate. Theirs is $36, so quite low. Targeted rate or a... Perfect? We've called it a targeted rate. It's fixed. It's, it's that fixed. So the councils can choose a different way to word it. We will have had legal advice back in the day when yep. we needed it um, to say that we should charge it and call it a fixed, the first cubic metre charge rather than a fixed rate, but it's essentially doing the same thing. Yep. So there might be different terminology that people use. Okay. Um, Hauraki also have a targeted rate. Theirs is $142. Um, and Whakatane uh, charge a, a rate of between $160 and $300 for the fixed rate. And accordingly, um, their usage rate is about $1.67. Okay. So they would all vary depending on. You know, it's a re yeah, it's a reflection on what they need to spend. Yeah, yeah. Plus, you look at Bongarei District; it's spread over a lot more users too. Mm. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. and through the chair, now, question number four that you asked was about doing a um, an, doing some examples of the difference between capital value and land value. We were going to do that for the next LTP, but it has become a little bit problematic in that. We don't know what costs we're going to have because of the three waters going. So you, over, you know, what overhead you'll have left after three waters. So that makes it a little bit problematic. We could still do it based on last year's costs, so you can get an idea about where the costs would fall, but they wouldn't be the exact costs because we um, don't, we haven't done the work to work out what would we look like without three waters. And is that yeah? And uh, so, so we can do that, and that's something that we that. Um, Christine and I can um, discuss. Is that something you want us to do? Something you want us to do for the long-term plan? Look at the changing the rating base? Look, I am interested in it, but I'm hung, hang over from the conversations we were having last term. So I don't even know if yeah. this council would be completely aware of. Councillor Howard, do you like your... Oh, excuse me, I was next. I thought he was, actually. No, I've been... Okay, then. And, uh, uh, so my, my question is, why is it so difficult for us to split the targeted rate over over the year, given that the costs are over the year? It's not, it's not difficult. We're saying we can do it. Okay. And that we could do. Um, we'll... Can we seriously look at and consider that option? Of course. Cool, that's what. Yeah. If that's the best option for what you guys want, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Howard. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I guess my question follows on from Councillor Paniora a little there. In this modern day and age, um, is it not possible, A, for our rates, rates demands to be electronically mailed, uh, just to a point that was made earlier, um, and encouraged that way? And also, um, are we able to do, because as I understand it, uh, water rates are charged separately, they're, they're not part of the rates um, bill. Um, why could we not have them on APs? And so therefore, build monthly to all households. I'll let you answer that, Christine. Yeah, so um, people are welcome, as we said earlier, they're welcome to pay them off. So we people, rather than invoicing them regularly, which would be more cost, as Sue's pointed out, um, we need to read them manually. Uh, rather than invoicing them, they say people can pay that, and we do have a number of people that pay their pay their water rates in that way. Some people pay in advance. It's hard knowing what they're going to use in in, in the future, but um, a lot of people have signed up for that. 
So Every Christine, can you, can you give them the percentage of people that we've tried to capture where we can, the email, um, their email address to send them an electronic invoice? Okay, I can come back with that. I don't have that information now. Well, uh, thank you both Sue and Christine. I, I mean, I just think that, you know, as you've said, that there are significant costs in the dear old um, dinosaur um, uh, process of post. And, um, you know, I mean, I think that, again, it, it, it's it's narrative, it's communication, it's, it's maybe incentive, I don't know. But there's ways that if we can keep, you know, pushing um, without burdening our admin process um, to get, um, well, rates out by email, um, and but certainly the options. I know that Christine, you say that you've got payment plans. Um, that takes ongoing admin, as I would think, to check it off. Whereas if we've got APs in place that that we can control, um, that takes away a lot of admin. I would have thought. Um, but I, I mean, don't worry about commenting now. I'm, I'm just putting it down, out there is that I think that, you know, where we can for efficiencies and being, you know, the the uh, the council that, um, you know, is really up there on services and, and, and making things easy for our constituents. Um, they are things that we may need to, we may be able to look at further than where we are at the moment. No, okay. that's good. Thank, thank you. We'll take that on the board. Um, Through the, here, I could just, sorry. Hang on. <laughs> um, I just, yes. just want to comment on that, that we've got 27% of our ratepayers that have signed up for, this is land rates, but when they get their land rates invoice emailed, we also email their water invoice. So we've increased that um, substantially, for, well, substantially, from 24% um, three months ago. We, have, we are doing targeted marketing around it. We have got on the envelope sign up for um, rates by email, and we're seeing a good a good impact from that. Good one, Councillor and Wilson Collins. I was next. He was. <laughs> he was next. So you can go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, just um, yeah, easy peasy. Fill out a form. I get my all my rates by email. Have done for years. Um, the I just I just wanted to narrow our focus a little bit um, in this discussion. I don't think the issue is is payment plans or paying off rates. I know the staff work really closely with people who need to do that. The issue here is affordability. And we've got families, as you can see from these charts, in all these scenarios, um, you know, households of two to four people who, who are having, you know, our, our water rates are just not affordable. Um, so I think it's trying to smooth that out. And, and it's the shock that you get when you get that first Cubic metre charge on your water rates bill. Who's on water rates? And yeah, right. So it's that it's that water rates bill that you get. That's four, five, six hundred, six hundred, eight hundred, nine hundred dollars, depending on your size of your household, compared to the other one that's like maybe sixty dollars. Yeah. And it's the planning around that. These are people. We're, we're, we're trying to consider the people who don't have the advantage of necessarily being able to spread that, like even when they do try and spread that cost over here, it's really difficult for them. And I think that's that's the focus. That's Especially the when you get your rate, land rates the same day, yeah. even on like, you know. <laughs> so I think, so. yeah, for me, if I could give my direction, because I've asked my questions, thank you. But my direction, I mean, I would, I'm very interested in, in splitting the cost over the two bills. That helps when people are selling their houses too, because we have arguments about that sometimes um, as well. So, so I think that um, makes it at least more even. They're going to get accounts each six months that are going to be hopefully around about the same amount. At least they know what's coming. Um, I think that would be helpful. But I also, um, I also feel that um, scenario B makes things more affordable for our households, and yes, it does increase um, costs for our highest users. But we, but water rates are, are, are seen as a user pays charge, and and I think that that we, yeah, I'm gonna go that way and hope we land <laughs> somewhere else. Thank you. Councillor Vincent. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I, I think I'm following on a general. 
um, line taken by um, previous members that um, if we look at uh, the water being two charges, one which being the standard figure, a monthly charge, the same amount every month, if, if there was a, like I don't know how you would implement it cost effectively, but if you had it so that it was a monthly charge and then the, the usage, actual usage charge being twice a year still, that, that might well uh, solve the problem if, the, if that could be somehow achieved and call it availability charge or whatever, or the, the line charge or, um, but one that's as a standard, um, that, that, so the annual, like the equivalent of the first cubic meter being a monthly charge that um, was payable yeah, on that basis. Councillor Williams. Um, through the chair, can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear, Rachel. Um, yeah, look, I um, support what Erin um, Councillor Wilson Collins has said about splitting the fixed rate. And um, if we could, you know, even look at, at more than um, two charges just to, you know, to ease the, the burden on people, um, especially with, you know, what we're going into next year and with other costs that could come into the general rates. Um, I think we just have to be really mindful that it's, yeah, it's really difficult for people. Um, and the more that we can do um, to help them, I think, yeah, we should, we should be looking at that. Thank you, okay. Councillor Madison. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, can I ask, uh, have you studied the effect of people substituting to have their own water tanks mm -hmm. and the reduction, therefore, in demand, what that would mean to the uh, rates rate change? No. I haven't. Uh, would you expect it to have a significant impact? <clears throat> it's getting to the stage that I think it's got to be uh, something they'll consider. Um, through the chair, so it's not what our council is considering helping people with at the moment and giving them funding, um, but it could be something that individuals are, and um, but it won't. We've only we've got a year until the new entity A takes over, and that is what we've been told is happening. So we have to assume that that we're still on track for that. Um, so we, it won't make a difference to this council. Council Lambeth. Yes, um, through the mayor, thank, thank you. And, and the councillor Wilson Collins mentioned it with the sale of properties. Um, you ought to try it with tenancies moving on. Um, that's a huge headache for everyone because tenants are demanding um, their money back because they haven't used it. So um, that, that becomes. Which is legally correct. Um, that, that becomes a real issue. Um, the other one is that if people people are sharing a, a water and it's not metered between the two, that one-off bill becomes a huge battle and sometimes the landlords are mediators between groups. It, there's a lot of problems here and a drip fed, even if it's fortnightly or or monthly, I think that is going to be the best option. As far as emailing out um, our rates go, you must bear in mind that there are still a large percentage of the population who are not online. So we've got to accommodate that. Power bills give you a reduction in mailing costs if you decide to email and not get it by postage. I'm just, just a thought out there. Yeah, so with rates, um, they're quite specific. So there's quite a lot of legislation about what you can charge and not. So there's potential for that sort of thing to look forward to. So you have the, the option of the monthly charge if you sign up to get the bills online. So for the last one, get your hand up. I'm a little bit confused with the direction this conversation is going, actually. I, I understood that we were sending out rates demands on a quarterly basis and we're getting suggestions of fortnightly and monthly payments. It's for water bills. Through the chair, yeah, water bills are six monthly. Six monthly. Yeah, they get two invoices a year, not on their land rates. Oh. So through you, Mr Mayor, and sorry, Councillor Larson, so, so 
I think we've got the general flavour here that you, you want us to look at that and increasing the frequency for the water bill. So that's what we, we're going to look at. Just noting, of course, Sue's last comment and that when any entity A takes over, they're going to do it their way. So yeah. admin for a change in it, which is fine for the next year, but it's, I may change again. We don't have control over that. So just want to pause you on that. I'm mindful we are going pushing time. Uh, it, that's the direction I've heard. Is there any contrary view to that? No, I think we can move on from that. Can I just make a few comments? Um, it, it's probably what the entity is going to move towards anyway. So the more that we can get our ratepayers into the accustomed to that system, the better. Um, the whole first cubic metre, I think, is arbitrary um, because the, the tap never stops. So for us to call it a the first cubic metre is um, probably needs to be rebranded, and yeah, that's my final comment. Okay, thank you. So let's move on. I think we it's about watch the space a little bit and see what we come back with. So okay. We'll best work in that, and then Sue wants to talk about the UABC as well with you, Council. Right. So this is another area which we need guidance on. Um, oh, this gives you an idea. So the. Um, yeah, this is the UAGC. So we gave you a whole lot of spreadsheets so you could actually see what does it actually mean when it hits the um, each individual property and the value of it. And obviously most of the rates are on land value. So um, you can see here we've taken a, um, a, a summary of that, that a low value property of 77,000 uh, of the land value in Dargaville Currently, they'd pay 2,305, and if we um, had kept the UAGC, which has been at the same rate, I think, for two years, for the last two years, um, at 764, then you've got two, it would cost people in Dargaville 2,436. If we reduce the UAGC to 726, which it was two years ago, then the person in Dargaville with a $77,000 value land value would pay 2,403. And you can see what happens when we start looking at um, the higher value properties, um, obviously that goes up. So you're changing the burden. So you can do that. You may choose not to change the UAGC. Um, and that may be another way of helping properties is rather than um, looking at changing the water rate that you work with the UAGC, but that's uh, there's different impacts. So we just need some guidance on that from you. If you're happy to keep the UAGC at 764, or you want us to reduce it, or you want us to increase it. Councillor Larson. Oh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, yeah, um, I think the UAGC is a way of smoothing rates. Um, and I, you know, I don't want to see these big Jumps and falls. Um, I, I think we need to push the UAGC to a position where we try and make it a more neutral rather than a big ups and downs. Um, ultimately, we only provide really one core service to everybody, and that's a road to the boundary of their property. And because we don't have any have this very coarse differential that we use to multiply by the land value, we're ending up with these huge discrepancies in what people are paying to get a road to the boundary of their property. The only way that they can realise the increased um, equity in their property is to sell it, which obviously they don't want to do. Um, so I would be inclined to see how far we can push the UAGC without having such a great big, um, you know, I, I don't think we should be putting the rate up for some people for the same service and have it going down for others. And we should be using the UAGC as a lever, as coarse as it may be, to try and level that out a bit. And I'd like to know what our UAGC threshold is for the maximum we can push the general rate to, which I think is is it thirty percent of um, general and targeted rate that threshold under the Act. Yes. Yeah. I'd be interested to know what that number would be as a UAGC, and then come down from that to give some sort of position of fairness yeah. and equity across that. Thank you. 
shall I just respond through the chair to that? Um, currently, our uh, UAGC is top of my head is about twenty seven percent. Twenty seven. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Work that out for me. Councillor Howard up there. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I would have to say that I would concur with uh, Councillor Larson's views on, on this, and I think that particularly if it can provide benefits um, for those on water rates, you know, an equalisation factor. So uh, I'd be supportive of uh, the direction uh, suggested by Councillor Larson. And with that, um, I need to bid you a fond adieu and. Uh, I'm very sorry, I need to leave. So we'll uh, look forward to catching up. Thank you, Mike. Right Councillor Mellison. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. I noticed that uh, in both the um, general rates and the water rates, uh, most of the predictions for the years ahead are for an increase next year. Now, as I understand it, the world is actually facing a depression and the same with New Zealand. And I wonder why council is acting differently to how everybody else is going to be forced of necessity to adjust their incomes. And it will probably rebound on council with a greater number of rates not connected. And I think if council has a need to recover, well, I can't see it, and I don't, don't think at the moment it's going to be particularly progressive for council. It's going to be counterproductive. Um, comment. So the comment is, if you want to reduce our rates further, then we have to go back to the expenditure um, and look at how do you want to reduce our level of service? That's We're, we're um, advocating just over 5% and under 5% for general rates, we're doing far better than most other councils. Um, I mean, the costs are increasing for us too, the cost of supply, contractors. Um, and we, have, we can't just um, absorb those. Yeah, I, I think what Councillor Manus is identifying there is we're coming into some pretty rocky times. I mean, we're looking at significant costs for these recent emergency events so you know that word prudent comes into it and we have to look at um you know uh keeping expenditures as low as we can so it's an ongoing battle i know but we have to be very conscious as a council to keep on top of it councillor larson oh thank you your worship yes um just coming back to that uagc thing i think the point there is that if you increase the uagc then you are reducing the other components of the general rate. So you're not actually, by putting the UAGC up, we're not saying we're going to try and put the rate up overall. Is that correct? Um, um, but what we're, oh, sorry, Sue. Well, okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, what, we're, what we're showing you is that we've currently got it at 764. Yes. And we're, we're proposing what, well, we're showing you what it would look like if it was reduced, not included. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what, when I look at if you take if you're saying that seven sixty four is apparently twenty seven percent of our cap, uh, twenty twenty seven percent of the maximum. It's at twenty seven percent, and the maximum is thirty. If you take seven sixty four and divide that by twenty seven and multiply it by thirty, that gives you eight forty eight eighty eight. Which would, if your figures are at twenty seven twenty seven percent now, that gives us what our maximum could be. Potentially. Yeah. yeah, it's not quite that simple, but yeah, yeah. Okay, so we can work on those figures. We've got some direction on that, so we'll come back to you on that. So, um, if if there's any other questions about the UAGC, we'll take those. I've just got one more slide. Yeah, Councillor Wilson Collins, he's got one there. I, I don't have a question, but I just, um, if you're going to come back to us with with a higher rate, can you still include the 726 figure so we can compare? What the impact would be, say, if it lowered or if it increased, because from what I, from where I was looking, I thought lowering it was actually um, reducing quite a lot of the impact for some for some of the higher increases. So that was smoothing out the the increases for everybody, the percentage increases. So I'd just be interested to compare all three options. Yep, yep. we can do that. Thanks. I think that next slide's. 
So if we keep going through, oh, that's just a, um, to tell you about what our, um, you know, what the property is, how it's categorised. So um, it's just for information. Um, so if we go to the next slide, which is about capital projects, then you can see here, we're going to need to take account of um, recent events. I mean, what we propose, I've just said to you that we've only completed 27 million out of 68 million capital in this year, 22, 23 year. Um, and that next year, um, as per this plan, annual plan, we're planning for 42.4 million plus thinking that there was going to be $8.5 million um, carried over, which I think there's going to be far more. If there's a $40 million gap and there's only four months to go, there's going to be a much bigger gap than $8.5 million. So we have to really revisit things, prioritise. and um, but, but what this is showing you is what we landed on for the projects at the time, um, $42 million worth of projects and how they are funded. And so you can see there's far more um, although we're still trying to use some of our depreciation for renewals, we're trying to use um, financial contributions where we can and DCs, that um, there's a lot more being used um, in debt. Um, and obviously we're continuing to get subsidies, but those are primarily the Waka Kotahi subsidies because um, a lot of the other projects will have completed by then. So if there's any, um, so going forward, we see that we're going to have to um, really change, look at reprioritising, this capital expenditure will change. Um, probably likely the capital expenditure we've got in our current um, our current year will also change um, with the inclusion of emergency and we'll have to push other things out. Thank you, Susan. Um, any other questions? Okay, I'm dying for a break. Um, Oh, Councillor Manderson, sorry, I did miss you. That's through you, Mr Mayor, and thank you. Uh, I'd just like to say again, I don't think Council is giving enough consideration to the future outlook for many industries and even for Council. I, I think that, that you, you should consider acting ahead of the demise of many uh, instead of afterwards responding. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay, um, let's have a five minute break. And uh, so we'll come back at uh, 11 Six minutes. Break.
Yeah, we would then consult with the community if we were to remove one in accordance with um, the local government section 82 consultation process. Uh, so I think that answers that. And then he had a question about wastewater. Is this being taken out of the remission and postponements because it's going to three waters? And yes, that's right. So that's why it's all crossed off at the back of the report. Okay, so I'll just talk through some slides that I've got here. Um, it's coming. Slowly, here we go. Just, to, just for um, new councillors and those that don't understand, I just thought I'd um, explain the difference. There is a difference between postponement and remission, and the fact that we have policies, but there's no mandatory requirement for us to put them forward. Um, there is a cost to rates remission. Uh, rates postponement delays or defers payments until either a specified time or event. 
Um, it, we can do that for any of the rate or all of it. Um, and we have to state conditions and criteria. We could charge a fee um, and it could be registered as a charge on a rating unit. So these are things that um, council can discuss and change if they wished. Uh, rate payers must apply um, for postponements and these are less common across um, the country uh, than remissions. Uh, so basically what we're doing is we're, we're, the burden stays with the land and the person will pay that in the future at a certain time. With the rates remission, we permanently forego payment um, and it shifts the burden of rates between rating units. So when we write um, rates off or penalties off, that, that, that income is still required. So the rest of the rate payers in the district do pick up that. Um, how do I make this simple? Uh, we have a bucket, so when we're setting the budgets, we have a bucket of money, uh, a bucket there saying that we'll allow, say, $300,000 towards remissions. That, that is money is collected from across the whole district ratepayers as a, as a whole. I don't know if that makes sense. I hope it does. Uh, so again, you've got to have pol policies. Uh, the policies have to be clear with objectives and criteria. And final discretion to decline a remission um, and we shouldn't be exercising that arbitrarily so we need to be quite clear on our policies. Um, Councillor Lambert, can you interrupt please? Yeah, through, through the mayor, just right on that topic there, um, three aspects. Um, the first one is council land, do they pay rate? Yes, land is rated, yes. Right. Um, the rate reduction we have for lower income earners, is that funded by central government or funded by the council? So you're talking about rates rebates? You yes. They are funded from central government. Thank you. Um, and also the next question is um, land which is exempt from rates, um, um, Maori land, so central government or us? Us. Okay. So, um, all, I said all land is rateable. All land is rateable unless it's listed in Schedule 1 of the Local Government Rating Act. Um, this council doesn't provide much infrastructure to Māori land. There's hardly any roads or... Yeah, sorry. Structure. Hang on, can we go there? Question answered. Yeah, so the law provides what's non-rateable. And when we do calculate our rates, we don't include those properties that are non-rateable in the calculation when we're dividing up who's going to pay what. So essentially, we're paying the district pays for. Okay, right. Yeah. So council land is paid by us, and eventually, yep, yeah, right, central government, and then we're paid by us with other ones. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Government land is exempt from rates if it's used as a reserve, so it's listed in the in the act as well. Yes. So if the government, yeah, sorry. So, so when you say it's exempt from rates? It's non-rateable. It's non-rateable. So the government doesn't pay the rates on it? It doesn't get charged rates. It doesn't get charged at all. If it's non-rateable, so let's go to the... Can I make a statement? So my statement is that um, most of the, the Māori land that doesn't, that gets a rates rebate or nobody's paying for it because there's no infrastructure and services that are provided to most of the land. Um, so there's no. Yeah, that that could be useful when we get on to that part of the. Discussion. I just want to. Okay. I just want the other side of the coin. I didn't mean to interrupt. I'm just because of the. Excuse me, Mark. We'll go back to hands up, please. Yeah. Move on. Thank you. Oh, did you want to answer? Um, so the go the government land is just not rated. They don't pay their rates on their land. Is that correct? No. Um, that's a broad view. So. So the government owns Housing New Zealand. So Housing New Zealand, you would consider that to be government, I would. Yeah. Um, rates, are, rates are paid on those right. properties. They don't meet the criteria of not credible. Right. So there are criteria. We don't say government doesn't pay. Um, it's the use of the land that determines whether it's rated or not. Yeah, I'm just trying to work out what um, rate payers are sponsoring, other rate payers and all that sort of thing. So the government would be paying those rates for Housing New Zealand as an example. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, further questions? Okay, move on. 
Okay, so um, just wanted to go over what good practice is when we are reviewing policies. Um, so we, we need to um, link them to one or more of our community outcomes and other strategic priorities. Um, they need to be complementary to other programs that are provided by us, the district council. Um, they should be generic, phrased in terms of categories of rating units rather than referring to a particular rating unit. Um, we should review them frequently. The law says we need to review them every six years at a minimum. Um, in the report, and I may have even put it here, I've um, put down the time, time frames of when we last reviewed them. Um, they need to be clear in the criteria and clear who makes what decision. Any questions? No, move on. Yeah. Uh, so I just did a table which uh, just covers what was in the report, basically just showing you the, the policies that we currently have, the number of rate pa um, properties that, that fall into that are getting this remission, and the amount that it's cost um, over the last year. Uh, so we currently have two properties that um, are sitting in our Māori freehold land postponement um, area and the remission there is three and a half thousand. Um, yeah, you can see for yourself all the details there. Um, the I guess there may be a question around the uniform annual general charge and other uniform charges on rating units. Uh, I haven't been able to split out how much is remission and how much is actually falling under the Act. That's due to um, us not having separated those out within our rating database. Um, the effect to the customer is the same. So if a property is used as one, two properties are next to each other and they're used as one, um, they fall under being able to pay less in the Uniform Annual General Charge space. Is there anywhere to find um, what those 69 community sporting and other organisations are that get rebates? Is there anywhere to get a breakdown of who? So you want to know the, the name? Yeah, specifically. Um, I think that's okay. I'm not sure I can look into that. Um, I'm just thinking privacy, but I think you can. See who is sponsoring there as well. Yeah. Yes. Are there any further questions? Perhaps I am going. Thank you. Um, just looking at the one rates postponement for financial hardship, does that mean that that figure includes penalties and arrears, or is that actually, yeah, yes, it does. So it's not just the rates that they were. No, that's the amount that's posted. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's... And I wouldn't be giving the property details on that one. No, 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 no. I'm not interested in asking the that. details. I was just, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, just getting that clear. Thank you. Oh. Just how difficult it can get for some. So what I'm looking for today is um, some guidance around whether the um, well, is whether you want rate of rates remission and postponement policies to be reviewed. As I said in the report, they were reviewed um, three years ago with the last long-term plan. Something specific in these is that you want me to that you want us to review. Then um, let us know. Uh, we don't statutorily have to review those coming out long term plan. Um, it can be deferred for another three years. Um, yeah, so that's the first question. Did we be reviewing the existing policies? Question. Um, Given that we've had this, um, these two big events, I think um, we're going to be in a position where we may need to. What's your thinking on that, Christine? And oh yeah, the next thing I'm going to put forward is um, possible. Um, it's up on the slides now. Future ones to consider. We don't need to review our existing ones potentially, but we can bring in new ones if we want. To. Um, so one of those is. A remission for land affected by a natural calamity. Um, as we can see, quite a few councils have those policies in place. Um, so that's if 
the criteria could be if your property is yellow stickered or red stickered, we might do this for you. Um, we, we can work on the criteria for that. Um, so, so, so through the right. chair, yeah. So I think what you're talking about, um, Mr. Mayor, is the um, fact that we may look at um, those that have been affected, um, say that they've had um, red stickers or, or whatever on their properties, that those particular properties may, we may well look at the, um, whether we can remit this next six months rates. And that's something I haven't brought to council. So that would be a separate to an ongoing rates remission policy. This would be a one-off. So is that what you were um, talking about? Yeah, yeah, I was just thinking that we've got, we've got okay. new, New issues to consider, haven't we? I'm Council Panori. Yep. You had a question. Just quickly, when was the last time that we reviewed the policy? Sorry, I missed that. Um, three years ago, for the the suite of them, the Māori freehold land one comes separately. For the other ones, it was three years ago with the long term plan, and there were only minor um, wording changes made. At the... Okay. So we don't have to review them this time, but we can. If you, if you wish, um, I think a full review, but certainly specifically looking at that's going to be important, isn't it? Sorry. The the, the the issue of the hardship that we've got around now is going to be the focus of what we're looking at going forward. Would that still be captured under the current um, hardship policy anyway? Our remissions policy. Yes, our remission policy for hardship um, is actually. It sets quite a high bar for criteria to be able to be met. Um, so that could be something that this council would like to review, bearing in mind we all hear the criteria. Um, you have to own only one property within the area, have lived in it for at least five years, if not sure. Um, have no other assets, go to a budgeting advisor um, to get support that, that you are actually looking at how you can pay your rates as well as all your other bills. Okay. Um, and and yeah, and they basically have to say that if the person paying if they pay their rates, then they will have an ability no ability to pay their other. And is it kind of like unforeseen circumstances that have resulted in an inability to meet the? Okay. Okay. Councillor Aaron Wilson. Thank you. Um, I so my direction is the existing suite of policies. I don't think we need to review them now. Um, and I think that the that the the document that Sue is bringing forward, separate to these rates remissions policies, to help with this current emergency, um, is great. And I think that will definitely, hopefully, help a lot of people. But I am interested in an ongoing um, remission for land affected by natural calamity as well. Sure. So through the chair in a previous. Life, uh, I was at a council that did not have a policy for natural calamity, and then they were affected by a large event, wasn't Christchurch. Um, and council had to meet under urgency to implement a policy because we didn't have one. Uh, we couldn't just write rates off for people. So that delayed it and caused a bit more stress for people. Whereas if you've got a calm time to look at it, say at the moment, as calm as it is, um, it gives a, a better um, putting for making your decisions. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm in agreement with that because, yeah. especially at what we heard out at Waikato to um, Marae, the, the mayor and I, was similar things that could have really helped in a, in, a, in a policy. For example, non contractors going out doing the work quickly to get the roads open and then they're out of pocket because they've had to hire diggers and things like that to come in. Um, yeah, so that's. I think something that we definitely need to look at. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And through you, uh, can I ask that when you're reviewing rates policy, I see that to date nearly all discussion about it has actually been about balancing your books. But I'm aware that over previous generations, councils have frequently used rating policy to change land uses. And I don't see where there's any consideration to that. Uh, and we may be facing the necessity of it. So I raise a recommendation that uh, the council considers changing land uses in the, the respect of its policy and uh, rates on land. 
I'm not sure that that's a legal thing that we could do. That's why. But we can look into that. I don't think that's ever stopped anybody that really wanted to do something. <laughs> I think we would be very careful here through the Mayor. We'd be very careful in our district to make sure that we follow the rules um, when it comes to rates, especially. I'll accept that. Okay. So okay, I'm just, so, can, yeah, so no, Councillor Manderson, sorry, through the Chair, just trying to understand, is that in terms of things like what we've done for the forestry rates, where we've changed um, the incidents? I'm aware uh, that, say, in uh, Palmerston North, uh, they adjusted the rates in order to uh, facilitate land development, oh. as an example. Right. So um, that means that the slant on rates can affect land use. Mean. So. Well, thank you. Thank you. Three, three, three. Through me, that would be um, the promoting business development could be an option okay. as a as a policy. Yes, I see what you're saying now. Yeah. Sorry, Sue. Yeah. So, uh, so through you, Mr. Mayor. So, so what I'm hearing is that the current policies. I'm not seeing a desire to to uh, review those uh, at this stage. However, you're you're interested in the natural calamity one and in the promoting business development one. Uh, for us to look at as an organisation, come back to you. Is that a fair summation of where we're at? Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. One final comment. Cool. I d thank you. Thank you. Sorry, looking at the wrong person. No, I just, I just, when the, that that, that um, table that you gave us that showed what we actually offer our ratepayers compared to what some of the other districts offer, um, I actually, for once, want to commend previous councils for getting us to a point where we actually seem to be um, one of the leaders in the country of actually helping and having facilities in place to to help those people that, that need it. Um, because we seem to have quite a range already and now we're looking at extending that. So that's that's brilliant. Yeah. Thanks yeah, thanks Councillor Larson who's been here since I was twelve. <laughs> really? No. Oh, <laughs> I know you've been here for a long time. <laughs> uh, so the last the last component of this is the multi freehold land rates postponement and remission policy. So um, as the report says, if we reviewed this in March 2022 to ensure compliance with um, requirements of the changing local government rating act. Um, we at that time, because of a lack of resource and time, we did a bare bones, this is what we have to do to meet the legislation type process. During that, we did um, have an undertaking with our iwi partners that we would again review it fully so that everyone gets to have a comment about um, what should be in there or how things should look. Once we also knew what the legislation would do um, and what impact it would have on Māori land. Uh, my question is, well, again, well, we had undertaken to review this. Um, so one, can I confirm that we will, and along with the long-term plan process, and whether we would like to consider expanding the policy to provide remission to Papakaianga and or Kaumatua flats. So we've got a couple of um, examples here. Far North have a policy for that, as do Nelson. Um, I just wondered if, if there was any appetite for us to consider because of the social impact that um, that those um, housing situations have with Marae, uh, whether we would also consider providing some sort of remission in that space. Councillor Manison. Oh, Councillor Manison had his hand up first. Uh, yes, uh, through you, Mr Mayor, I, I also suggest that in setting the rates that council takes a Good hard look at the dependence this country has on the Chinese market. Um, both the majority of our dairy industry and our forestry incomes are both dependent on China. I've had a look at Zihan's writings, Z E I H A N, and he points out that there are not many um, young childbearing women left in China at the moment, and the population there could actually fall to 700 million only, which is about half of the present population, mm -hmm. in a short space of time. Mm -hmm. If one expects that 
country to maintain market income on dairies and forestry to the extent that we may be anticipating, I think we're going to be seriously disappointed. Oh, my statement. So, um, obviously, for me, that's a no-brainer. So, the question being, should we consider extend, extending the policy? Um, absolutely. When we look at my Marae, for example, down Station Road, um, we've got our um, Papakainga Reserve Land. We've also got Komatoa Flats and a Marae. The Marae stood there for uh, 114 years. Uh, we do not have street lights. We do not have footpaths. We do not have wastewater infrastructure. Uh, council provides a road, and that's it. So, um, and the benefit to the community is um, quite substantial. We've we've housed international rugby teams um, and sporting teams and royalty. Um, there's lots of history there and remissions for Papakainga would enable development that would enable you know us to close the gap uh, in the affordable housing crisis and situation that we have um, and encourage development in those areas. Thank you. Councillor Lambeth? Yeah, I've got um, a couple of questions about this. The local government of <coughs> the Whānau Māori Amendment Act, that is a Central Government Act, is that correct? That's right. And by them passing that Central Government Act, it puts a loading on local councils. I do believe that we need to expand it. However, there's going to be resistance from other ratepayers if they had to fund it. Is there any way that we can attack the government and getting them to back their act as far as looking after the rates for those properties. Just the Papakainga and the way they have it on, on land and, and who is the actual owner, who pays for what, is just totally unrealistic to work that out. Um, so through the, through the mayor. Yeah, so through the mayor, I don't think, um, the, I mean, what we're trying to do is, is look at how we can help in the assistance, we can try and get government, but that's um, a lobbying and they have other, it depends on their priorities. And through the mayor, in addition to that, um, when this act was going through, there were a lot of submissions made to it um, to sort of address the fact that uh, we're, not, we're not one of the highest district, we're not one of the districts with the most Māori freehold land that's unused. Those um, districts, did submit to the bill and say that it was going to cause them some sort of hardship to have to move those rates onto other ratepayers, and there's, there was no, no reaction. Okay, Councillor Aaron Wilson, comments? Okay, thank you. Um, I just, I just, I'm probably asking a really obvious question, but bear with me. Um, we're talking about social housing on Māori freehold land only. Is that right? Um, sorry, no. Uh, what one of the councils has is their remission says that it's for self, social papakainga housing. So they've got a determin they've got a determination of what social housing is. They've got community groups that provide social housing. Yeah. So that's a separate component to their um, to their. But this wouldn't necessarily be an extension of the Māori freehold land rates policy. This could be a it could be a separate one. It could indeed. Um, yeah, I saw it sitting in the Māori freehold land space if we only wanted to provide for that, but it could be a separate standalone um, policy which also encompasses social housing. If that's I'm, in I'm, I'm interested to know about both versions and how and, and what what effect that would have. I'm definitely keen on the on the um, Papakainga and Komarua housing because we know that we've got some really underdeveloped areas that are providing um, housing for for people, um, and there's a there's a there's a gap there. And we as a council have had discussions about um, social housing and the need for more affordable housing in our district. So anything that can kind of encourage that, I am interested in, bearing in mind how that affects the rates overall. Um, yeah, so I just yeah, I'd be really interested to learn more about it. 
Okay, because off the top of my head, I don't know that we have a lot of social housing. We don't have a community. Um, this wouldn't encompass, we wouldn't want to be um, providing a remission for Housing New Zealand houses, for example. Yeah. We'd want it to be a community based. Yes. Which I don't think we have. Uh, we look after our own pensioner houses. Yeah. You know, at this point, so that, that's there may be some coming. Cut some coming. <laughs> so it might be worth having. Yeah. Okay. Right. Thank you. Fine with that. Councillor yeah, Larson. Oh, thank you, Your Worship. Yeah, just, just want to clarify around this Maori freehold um, land rates um, topic. How much are we charging per annum in Maori freehold land rates? I don't know the answer to that one. Yeah, I don't expect you to know everything off the top of your head, but I just think you just get some quantum around this. So how, how, the first thing is how much we're charging per annum. And then how much per annum is actually being paid? And then thirdly, how much are we writing off per annum? Okay, so coming to the audit and risk report, um, there is a summary of what we've written off so far this year with our new um, revenue um, officer on board. So we will be reporting that, but I'll. Um, 3,000. That, sorry, just the table we had earlier. No, I'm not Party. talking about that. No, I'm not, not, not just talking about the um, remission. You're talking I about think I'm talking about what we're already writing off because what you're talking about here is um, an additional amount of postponement or remission for particular categories of multiple owner land. Is that not correct? Potentially. Yeah. I think we just need to have a look at the big picture of how much we're already not collecting, I how see. much we are collecting, so we can look at what the quantum of the burden is on the rest of the ratepayers who are having to pick up the tab. Because ultimately, when we when we have rates written off or remitted, <coughs> we aren't going and collecting less rates, moving the burden back to those that are already paying rates. And we are, and as you can see some from some of the numbers we've seen earlier today. Those amounts of rates are significant. So I think you're also referring to the statute that we do each year after six years. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. Okay. That's all. They they are as the conversations have been discussed today. That's all being funded by the other ratepayers. That's not being funded by central government who have set the legislation to allow it to be written off and not allow it to be collected. So my statement is that we'll be, we would be expecting half a million dollars from this council to my to Te Hoanga Marae for wastewater infrastructure at the very least. We would be expecting footpaths um, and lights at night and we'd be expecting all of the same things that everyone else in this um, town receives in this township that we haven't had for over 100 years. So um, it's hardly... It's hardly a burden being transferred to ratepayers when we're not even receiving the bare minimum um, of what everyone else in town receives, given that our marae has been one of the first buildings in this town for over 100 years. So just let's just um, include the whole picture in there and not, um, because I don't agree that council should be receiving rates for services that it doesn't even provide. Councillor Larson, sorry, uh, you were you just raised the point of clarification there. I wasn't referring to a specific property. Well, we should. I was referring to all of the under properties that. under that rating category. And we should look at examples. Hand up, please, if you yeah. want to ask questions or make statements. Other people have been making. But look, it's relevant. Please. Okay. Any further questions? Okay. Let's move on. Thank you. That's all. Further questions? Okay. Next on the agenda is um, okay. Through the chair, I'm going to introduce this. Um, I've got with me Joy Hewlett, and uh, she'll she'll present most of it, but I'll just present the first part. So, council has to fund all of its costs, and from a variety of sources, it could be rates. It could be um, taking out debt or um, or from a reserve 
or from fees and charges. So um, this is basically looking at the fees and charges portion and there's some decisions here. And if you decide um, you want to reduce the um, reduce some of the fees, there will be there could be, depending on what it is that you want to do, there could be an alternative action because if we can't collect from fees and charges, then we've got to look at collecting by way of rates. So um, it's it's complex uh, decision um, or guidance that you'll be giving us today. So we're we're just giving you um, uh, what each annually we look at all our fees and, and charges. And the first part on your document is about the um, revenue and financing policy and the splits. And generally we have the policy, we can't change it at this moment, but what we do do is try and work out what is um, happening with the actuals and do they reflect what the council told us, how they told us they would um, collect it. And most of them um, are okay, except for, I think we've, we've um, put down about animal control obviously needs to be increased um, and resource consents, there is funding coming through building consents which are over collecting for some of the work that um, the resource consents does on PIMS and LIMS. So I'll hand over to Joy and she's going to go through um, the whole fees and charges. Do you have to put yourself on? Um, hello, sorry about that. Um, so yes, with, we've sent through the report and the statement of proposal of fees and charges and today we're looking from feedback and direction from you. Um, each year the activity managers assess their fees and charges against the revenue required for the long-term plan, the actual costs, any contractor charges and uh, the revenue and finance policy. Thanks Alana for the next one. So because you haven't, <clears throat> I just wanted to explain the process, the timeline around this. So um, in November, I begin to send out to the activity managers the current fees and charges, which they begin um, assessing their current fees. Um, that's all collated in December, January. Um, and we pull together a statement of proposal um, which is then presented to council. Um, if once you have decided that it's ready for consultation, it must go out for public consultation for a period of one month, at which time there may be people in the community or businesses that may want to have the opportunity to be heard around the fees and charges. So that's given another month and then it goes before council to be adopted and with the implementation um, of 1st of July. Um, there's just the next slide, thanks Alana. So um, these are just some of the changes that have come through from the building services manager. These are basically these changes were made to actually improve customer experience. So it was decided that um, a separate swimming pool fencing consent fee was um, implemented instead because it wasn't actually a building consent. Um, the private wastewater system was um, they they reduce that because um, instead of having a, a larger um, application fee, they um, reduce the upfront fee so that actual costs per, um, per consent would be um, uh, applied. We've also included commercial building consents because of the additional work and complexity involved in developing compliance schedules around um, specified systems, which is a requirement of the, um, the Building Act. And um, both resource consents and building consents have removed a 10% um, surcharge, which was applied for processing consultant fees. So we've removed this completely and um, any administration fees will pick up, um, will be picked up for actual time spent, which should be quite a considerable reduction. Um, the building services managers also um, introduced a multi-proof 
fee. So these are for um, large building companies where they um, build, they have a, a build and approve design and they have to build it at least 10 times over two years. So that's called a multi-proof consent and um, that also reduces the processing time <clears throat> from 20 days down to 10 days because it's all been pre-approved. Uh, the resource consents, um, again, just that removal, uh, the resource consent slide. Thank you, Alana, thanks. Uh, we've taken out that 10% and um, just charging actual admin time. Uh, currently, uh, the resource consent manager is um, hoping to inter establish a fast track system for very simple non-notified land use consents. Um, the criteria is yet to be established and, um, and the time frame yet to be established, but that should be coming through very shortly. Um, there's also on the subdivision charges, um, he has um, split the fee. We had just one deposit for subdivisions, but just to prevent some kind of um, well, just to install, uh, uh, reflect the actual costs that are going to go um, against these, we've split them to one to five lots for th uh, first instalment of 3,200 and uh, six lots and over a higher instalment fee of 4,500. And that just kind of reflects, reflects the actual fees they're going to pay. Um, the summary of the moan changes are the cemetery fees which have been restructured to align with the co contractor charges. So, you know, the contractor put their charges up and we have to um, on charge those. Uh, same with the water service fees to align with contractor charges. There has been, um, we're hoping to uh, reduce the um, development contribution application fee for pos po postponement of payment. Um, down to $250 just to support um, some of the developers that, uh, you know, may not have the income coming in at the, that time. So it just um, reduces that fee for them. The district plan, initial deposit, notification deposit and hearing deposit, all of those fees have been looked at and just kind of swapped around a bit to better reflect um, what those, the fees are against those activities. So, um, yeah, if anybody's got any questions, I won't know everything, but I can certainly go back to the activity managers and help you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a quick question around the, um, the reduction from 1,000 to 250. Um, surely that would only apply to a postponement and not a, not a write-off, correct? Uh, correct. Uh, yeah, correct. Um, Councillor Paniora, uh, we only have had a couple of uh, rates post of po postponements of development contributions um, in the last couple of years. So and they pay interest. So we basically defer the payment of the development contributions, but we still collect interest. Okay, Councillor Erin Thank you. I sent some questions in. Um, ahead of time. Do you have those there and able yep. to answer them or do you want me to ask them again? No, that's so do you want me to answer some of those? Uh, yes, the dogs ones if you um and but they're not as Councillor Aaron uh, Wilson Collins. So if you do you want to answer those ones first? Um, yes. Um so Councillor um Erin Wilson Collins asked um, about the wedding route rehomed and rescued. Um, so that's a bit of a central government lead in. So they've changed their wording from uh, rescued to rehomed. Um, and of all of our previous reason charges have said rescued, we're transitioning to rehomed as well. Um, and so we're going to use both words in this um, publication. And then <laughs> that wasn't the question. What's my, my question was, why do we define them separately from just having a dog when the charge is the same? Uh, so I understand that rescued or rehomed dogs, we do give a, um, 
a, a lower feed just in the instance that we're Same. not according to this. Okay. Oh, actually, yeah, no, yeah. Oh, there's no, there's sorry, the charge doesn't go up. It doesn't say the charge goes up after the 31st of August, but the charge is the same. So it's 70, the, 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 the annual fee is $68, the proposed fee is 73 for a dog, and, the, and, the, and it's the same for a rehome dog. The only difference is it doesn't say that it goes up. So I didn't notice that before, but is that the only difference? Yeah, that's correct. Um, the same, so the red wedding will be included in the final document. So the same question um, around the assistance dogs. So yeah, that will appear yeah. uh, in the final report. Um, and specifically around parking. Mm. Um, so I can tell you that most of our parking infringements happen uh, on the west coast in Dargaville because we have a 60 minute um, parking duration um, in town. And I can tell you that we... I know it's being infringed, but is it being ticketed? Yeah, so we... So only during peak um, season, so over the summer is generally where we do that. Um, and our AMOs and our wastewater bylaw inspectors um, complete uh, parking um, infringements. And we issued nine infringements um, over the last financial year. Oh, did they do... Did they do some monitoring over the last... Yep. Summer? Yes. So to date, we've issued um, since since July twenty nine packing infringements. Okay. Yeah. That's a menace on you, isn't it? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, Councillor Menison. Thank you. Um, I, I note that there's an extremely impressive number of further requirements that essentially increase the control of the planners. Um, it happened about 1,200 years ago, mankind first put a corral around livestock, and that started agriculture. Other classes soon caught on and put legislative barriers around their fields of expertise. Here we have another classic example of a dramatic increase in control and shift of power from the person with capital that's making decisions and getting things to happen to the people that have set themselves up to judge whether it should happen or not. Uh, thank you. Councillor Lambert. Yes, um, parking infringement. Um, you've had a few tickets, have you? Oh, no, you've issued a few. Sorry. <clears throat> yes, on that line, um, with many years involved with law enforcement, when you've got a law that's spasmodically engaged um, over different periods without notification to the public, um, it's a recipe for disaster. Um, I know that tickets aren't posted on vehicles, they're sent out electronically and they're getting them two weeks later. If it's okay and a blind eye is being turned certain periods of the year, and that person does exactly the same thing because it's an accepted behaviour. Um, I, I think we need to really address this because it's sending out a mixed message to um, our, our ratepayers, our residents, and our visitors. And through the chair, just I would say that um, in terms of park arrangements, we have an education first process. So what we will do is we'll um, let uh, shop owners and and um, business owners in the area understand that we are looking at the parking around that area. We also um, have the ability to issue warning notices for people that have been um, parking longer than 60 minutes in parks on a regular basis. Um, but people that park in an inconsiderate manner, like such as um, across double lines or, or double parking, um, we infringe straight off the bat with no warning notice. And that's what the majority of our infringement notices have been around. And, and just a supplement, you are going to keep it in-house? Right. Excellent. Because the, the contracting it out was a failure a couple of three years back, I believe. Yep. No, we've bought animal, dogs, and packing all in-house. Clear and Wilson Collins. Oh, I just want to um, counter the direction that's been given there. I think it's... Um, <laughs> just because no one's ticketing you doesn't mean you're not being a mm. sporty person. And, and quite frankly, in the Dangle Township, I am dealing with elderly people almost on a daily basis who cannot car park 
visit the services that they need to require. I'm getting complaints about it a lot. There's a five minute car park outside the post office that no one is ever in there for just five minutes. Um, there's all like like there's there's issue. There are parking issues all over all over the township, and it's not fair that people just because they can get away with it park in the 60 minute car parking. The 60 minute car parking was reduced some years ago. Um, because there was a lot of kickback about it, because the, the, the parking you could park in all day was, was further afield. We live in Dargaville, for goodness sakes. Um, I park all day, if I need to park, I park all day where it's not all day parking, and it's still literally like from here to the end of the balcony away. So I just, yeah, I, I, I don't think it's got to do with when and when we are and not ticketing. I just think that um, when we when we do go out to do the, the ticketing, that, that, that we need to make sure we're we do it for a solid amount of time and um, to break the habits of people that are not sticking to the to the parking. Yep. So, so can you next? I think it was. Oh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let you go first. Oh, okay, so there were two things. So the first thing is that I think it's um I don't know what the word is, but the Northern Regional Council building has three disabled parkings immediately in front of it, which I think is a joke because I know that you've only put them there so that you can um, stop people from parking in front of there. Um, that creates more issues over on the other side where we have the RSA and other facilities that do need the parks that have now been taken up by the NRC building. Um, so I think that those need to be reduced to one or two because when is three disabled um, ticket holders ever going to be in that building all at the same time, unless you're having a disabled committee meeting or something of that nature. And then the second thing is, um, can we get a little bit more statistics around the, um, the tickets that you say have been issued over what days, um, how often, what are the frequency um, of the patrollers coming out and patrolling those um, versus, I would like to see those st statistics as opposed to who was ticketed, because you could get 27 tickets in a day. So you could be saying, oh, well, we got 27 tickets since December, but that, that might have been you, you went out on the, I don't know, the 24th of December when everyone's in town and everyone's trying to get parks and going shopping. So yeah, but those are my... Good chair, we, we don't have specific parking officers, so we use our um, animal management, noise control and wastewater officers, um, and so they will um, be doing that as a, um, I guess, a second part of their job, looking for those as they go, so that's something we can look into. Um, and in regards to um, parking, I, I, I'm assuming that's NTA. Um, that, uh, oh, so through you, uh, Mr Mayor, so that's with the council building? Uh, we'll just, just yeah, yeah. So there's a resource consent issue, most probably, about the number of parks we have to provide for public facilities such as that. But despite that, I mean, is it a public facility though when there's NRC staff? It's a reception area for council. So yes, it is. That's um, interesting. But can I? So we never had um, three reserved parks prior to moving built, into that. Built years ago before those. Yeah. Were enacted. And, and sorry, Councillor Lars, I know you want to get to your question, but can I say, so fees and charges, right, when it comes to parking, they're set by the government. Well, you've got no, no take on it. But obviously what we're hearing here is uh, there's an appetite to have a look at the parking in Dargaville uh, and, and see what we can do in that space. Uh, 29 tickets over a year is not a lot, but of course uh, we've got AMOs out there doing their business and all this stuff as well and get drawn out and taken off for other work. So it is a secondary uh, bit of work that needs so to be So could we at this governing, governance level set a KPI that, um, you know, they're to dedicate, I don't know, ten, five to ten hours a week patrolling? So you can't leave that to us. I'm just so, going figures out there. Sure. But. So you leave that to us. What we're hearing from you today is there, there is a bit of a parking issue in Dargaville and we need to probably give that a little bit more attention. So so we've heard that. That's fine. And we'll work that out um, amongst the other business as well. Oh, thank you, Your Worship. Yeah. Um, I, I certainly don't want to discount the parking issues, and it sounds like there are some very real ones there. And um, fees and charges is often um, a topic where um, the conversation gets um, drawn in around 50 cents on dog fees or 20 cents on parking or something like that, and we overlook the big issues. Um, and um, you know, I see some very glaring changes um, in what's been presented to us today. As a as a council, we've now met and and agreed on strategic direction, although we haven't had that rolled out yet. And so it's a, not a perfect science we're dealing with here as we go through review. Um, 
And one of the things that um, will come to staff when that is rolled out is that we are continuing with one of our key community outcomes being a pr prosperous economy. And, and where we're heading, just to give you, I don't want to jump the gun in terms of that, but where we're heading is we, we want to um, push for affordable living, which includes affordable land and affordable housing. Um, as we head into difficult and uncertain times to give our district a shot in the arm and get our economy, keep our economy going. Now, when it comes to um, development, and I'm looking at your resource consent section here, things that will um, increase risk for a landowner are uncertainty of outcome, which is driven by um, resource consent applications that are restricted discretionary, discretionary and <clears throat> complying where the applicant doesn't know, having fronted up with their money, whether or not council will approve their application. Second driver, uncertainty of cost. Both of those things lead to, whether individually or collectively, to increased risk and increased risk leads to reduced activity. And we're trying to encourage activity in the district to keep our economy going, bring new people here and bring new businesses here. So when I go to your schedule of changes for resource consent here, I see that there is a backpedaling quite significantly to what we had specifically put in place in previous councils, which was to have our independent commissioners sign an agreement where they agreed to their hourly rate and that that then determined that the applicant knew at least at some level what that person would be charging out on an hourly rate. Now we have on page 23 of that PDF um, gone back as charged to council and no fee. And then when I look through all of the rest of that schedule, all of the charges are council's professional fees per hour plus any charges to council, etc. Um, I very strongly um, suggest that those numbers need to be locked down. We're setting these fees every year. So whatever we're charging out for, whether it's your junior planner, your senior planner or whatever, your engineer, your independent commissioner, they should all be specified in the document. Otherwise, we just get, can get fee drift. So uh, through the mayor, oh, uh, sorry, Councillor Larson, have you completed what you were saying? Well, I have now, go ahead. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry to cut you off. Um, so in response to that, what we are doing with um, our contractors is we've got a procure, we've started uh, looking at um, having a panel, you know, looking at our procurement and um, we've got someone helping us getting um, the documentation out to tender for um, a panel where they will state their fees so that we'll be able to put that in a document and also um, we'll take what you've said about the independent commissioner and go back to it because I think it was policy that gave us the um, the wording there so we'll go back when so when it comes when you see it again um, we'll have either an answer for you or it'll be changed. Thanks, Sue. I mean, I'd be interested to know why, rather than me have to pick this up amongst the detail, yeah. why that change has been made. We didn't, I don't remember it being discussed at any briefing. Um, and you, I'm happy for you to come back with an answer on that as well. I don't expect you to answer it off the cuff if you don't know. No, that's fine. We will come back to you it, because this will be brought back to you. The intention is that the fees and charges um, apart from the changes you've, um, well, the fact that's the only change, and then you've said you want us to look at parking. Um, but So we'll be bringing the document back to you at the end of the month council meeting for confirmation to go out to our community. Thank you, Sue. Councillor Williams, I see you've got your hand up. Yes, thanks, um, through the chair. I just had a, um, a query on dog owner surcharges. Um, on the schedule where it has failure to comply with Dog Control Act and about the next five lines down, there's been no increase in charges, whereas the others have had an increase. I just wondered what the why, why that was. 
I'll defer to Hayley there. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'll need to um, check with Dean, uh, who's our monitoring compliance manager, and he was supposed to be here today, but he's um, got an unwell wife. So I'll have to check with that for you and come back if it's okay, uh, Councillor Williams. Yep, that's fine. Thanks. Councillor Mendelson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, um, Councillor Larson has paid attention to detail, and I commend most of what he's saying there. But I do observe that councils are planning on an annual basis for nearly all of these things, whereas the developers of land, houses, buildings, etc., are taking a much longer term view, and they're frequently disincentivized by the council cost up front. So I commend that council perhaps alters its attitude and has a look at many of these things in terms of five-year developments, because all the developments that have not started are the annual rates that council's not receiving. It goes unnoticed, but it's significant. So if you can get people to start more often on these things, you will pick up much more over the five years. Now, you'll use common sense with the distribution of the income, but I call for uh, consideration of a little more flexibility there uh, and in terms of the upfront loading. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Lambert. Yeah. Through the mayor, um, for you, Sue, so, um, just a couple of little things there. We've, we've had an increase of around about 12 to 13 per cent in the cost of building. Um, because our um, consent fees are bracketed to um, different values, it will correspond as an increase in fees irrespective of what is in the red there on the building fees because a 100 square metre building will now um, move up to the next bracket and, and the like. Um, a recent article in the New Zealand Herald um, had information from GJ Gardner Homes, who their standard three bedroom house, they had put through five different councils. And um, besides the development contributions being taken of the Tauranga District Council, unfortunately, Kuiper featured at the top of the list as the most expensive council to get a building consent. Um, we, we'll go over that a little bit more in future. I'm trying to get that information from GJ Gardner to go there. But my question to you is that because we're using contractors so much to get our consents, because they're loading up the fee to you, are you back costing for each building consent to work out your fees? Um, I'm not sure about that. Um, I think it's just the, the cost of living. We've just put the cost of living on, which is the 7.2% right. as the fees. So that's how we've done those. Yep. Yeah, so, so there's been an increase in building costs, so that will in effect, um, by stealth, also increase your consent fees because they'll go up to the next bracket and the like. But are you working... Oh, okay, so have you done a back costing exercise on your consent fees on the time that is spent by the building consent office to get those plans through? Yes, my understanding is um, our building uh, services manager, Alistair, that he has actually been working out the whole cost. And that's why they've changed some of the commercial building work, because they found yep. that it's actually costing more. And so that the... Um, the uh, um, I suppose this, the small homeowner who's just building his own house was actually compensating some of the commercial work. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for that, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just comment that I think most of the building regulations, if, if not virtually all of them, are actually controlled by central government. Why can't we make an application to any council for consent in respect of those conditions? Now, that would then pitch one council against another, which is the common experience outside of council and of which council seems to be totally ignorant of. And that would actually put some competition and reduction of most of the fees involved in the consenting progress, process because it would now become uh, 
competitive. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Councillor. Um, we will. We do look at what other councils are charging, um, but I'd be really interested in seeing what Councillor Lambeth, the yeah. information that he's got. So, um, yeah. once you get that, please yeah. forward it to us. Yeah, no, I'll work together with you on that too. Thanks. Councillor Barry, you have your hand up next. Thank you for the chair. Um, my, I guess, discussion, conversation, or point is around total domain campground campground fees. So the proposed fee is $10 and I think that the overall fee is $20. My question is, given that we absolutely get fully booked at the beginning of every year, but the end of the year, the demand is so high, why are we not putting in there a peak, a higher charge for camping if the demand is so great? Why is it still the same amount? And given the 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 strangulation, I'm going to call it, on the resources at the lakes, with all of the showers and the toilets going, and we've got visitors coming from out of town, and what? And they're just paying ten dollars a day for for you know a slice of paradise, using our resources, etc. Is that can that be? Can we amend, look at amending that today to perhaps? So, Councillor Paniora, that can be um, changed, and I'll let um, Hayley answer that. And can we bring it to the next, to the April committee for well, so discussion as well? Through, through the Mayor, um, so the, the fees for Tahoroa domain will first go through the Tahoroa Governance Committee, um, so that would be item that we do there. So they were set, I believe, in uh, July last year, the most recent fees and charges. And we also agreed that we would not rely on ratepayer funding. So we increased the charges slightly for Tahara domain to be able to support the, the campground. Now we'll support the wider domain and maintenance. So that's definitely a conversation we could have at the Tahara domain governance. Thank you. That's a, that's a, uh, thank you, Your Worship. I realise we're um, 30 six minutes over schedule, which is going to give Mr. Schreuer's, um nine minutes to complete his presentation. So I'll speak very quickly if I can. Um, so I have found the schedule of professional fees now in the document, and I see that some of them are, are not substantial at page 14 of the PDF. For example, chief section, um, whatever that role is, is $222 per hour. Um, I realise that um, we can only charge what's actual and reasonable for these people, and whilst their hourly rate includes their overhead cost, I'd be interested to see the maths, how you actually land on these enormous hourly rates we're charging out at. I also see there is a council role called graduate. I'd be interested to know what their role is. They charge out of $166 an hour. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks. So just to clarify, um, the salaries are, are um, ba well, they're based on salaries, but also people have um, take up space in the building where there's a cost, take up, um, they've got Kiwi Savers, so, and, and ACC, and that comes into play as well. But for the reality is that not many general managers um, or even managers are involved in um, the resource consents. And these are actually being used, the costings are also being used for three waters. So we were very careful how we were um, we were putting the pricing together because we have to be able to justify it to, um, to them. So, and that's where general managers are actually being involved a lot in the three waters. If that wasn't really my question. My question was, I would like to understand the maths behind how you are calculating and I did say that I agreed that including salaries and overheads means buildings, etc. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we can come back to you. Councillor Vincent. Well, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I have a question and a comment. Um, I'll get my comment out of the way first. In, in terms of, I just responded to uh, Councillor Manderson's statement about trying to get a um, a level playing field across the country. That would be dependent upon each council having the same revenue and funding policy. Uh, we could easily reduce our fee by having the general rate payer pick up a greater proportion of the cost. So that's that's a debate we can have another time when we're reviewing that policy. Um, but there's also the other aspect of just, you know, 
if we're looking to find the most expensive way to do something or we're looking for the cheapest way to do something or most cost effective, shall we say. Um, and also regarding the um, um, postponement or re remission of development contribution fees, the question's already been answered regarding postponement, that um, the fact we charge interest, fair enough, uh, has many people have applied. But what are the circumstances where someone would be able to get remission of the development contribution? Um, yes, yeah, so through the through the mayor, um, the types of um, in the last two years, we've had two churches um, that have been built that have asked for remission, and so we've um, made a judgment there that uh, I think it was fifty, might have been fifty percent remission or forty percent remission that um, in development fees. I don't want to go into the detail of individual applications, but yeah, there's a fair question there, I guess. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? I've got 100, but not today. Uh, we're going to do the next one, Mr. Here, but can I just wrap this, this particular item up, if you wouldn't mind, just so I can give the team some direction, right? So, so we talked about next steps as we're going to come to the council meeting. With, uh, with a document that's finalised uh, that you'll need to adopt for consultation for a month. So we are aiming to do that this March, so the March, March Council meeting, uh, because we have to go out for a month and then uh, some of the fees, some of the, say for example, the dog feed letters have to go out to the owners well before 1st of July to pay by it. So that, there's a time frame issue here. Uh, so, so what I heard today was about the EB, uh, sorry, the, the commissioners um, bringing Back the change to to not having a set fee rather than as charged to council. Um, looking at Taharo domain increases possibly, and then uh, Councillor Larson was wanting uh, some logic to the professional fees that we're charging. Right, so that's that's the kind of direction I've got for the team here. So we'll make those changes and look into it, and then bring it back to you at the council meeting in March. Anything else there? Yeah, no, it's fine. Uh, look, okay. we're running out of time. Do you want to defer this next one to after lunch? We'll yep. do it now. Okay, let's, let's break for lunch. Um, lunch is 20 minutes roughly, so come back at about 12 minutes past. Okay, thank you.
Turn on it, so. Okay, let's reconvene and we are dealing with the long term plan, Kaipara Environmental Scan 2023. Mark, yeah, thank you. My team is Mark Shrews. Hello. Strategic Plan with the Council. Speak up, yep. Okay, so I'm going to take you through the environmental scan. Um, Try and quickly go through firstly what it is, and then also try and quickly go through each section. Try and keep your questions to the end and get through this quickly. And you can go back and forth through the slides as you can questions. Do you want to go to the next slide? Okay. So the environmental scan is basically an overview, high level overview of the operating environment of the Kaipara District Council, environment of the operator. It's about looking at how, what is the current state of the district and also how is it changing and what, what are the trends driving that change, what's making that district change. In terms of the current state, uh, we're not so concerned about like the recent storm damage. We're looking at that sort of longer term steady state. What is the, so for example, um, you know, we might, we might say we have a two lane road that runs through some unstable country. It can be threatened by land instability. That's more what we're going to report on rather than saying we have a two lane road currently reduced to one lane by a slip. What's important is that it's a two lane road, it's not a four lane highway. And also, if it's a two lane road, might it become a four lane highway and why? And so it's about that sort of longer term steady state. 
Uh, what the environmental scan does not do is it doesn't make recommendations. It can direct your attention to what some of the issues in the district are or what's happening in the district. What to do about it, that's another piece of work again. Um, we also don't go too in depth, it's supposed to be high level, and we can drill down deeper into any subject um, through other reports or other um, investigations. Um, the environmental scan is a key document that starts the process for our long term planning. It sort of gives you a bit of a baseline as to what's what the state is and what's moving and changing. And we can start to say, okay, now what do we do from here? How do we start with our planning? So it also informs the key forecasting assumptions in our long term planning. Next slide there. So, Comes up, start talking to this one already, perhaps it's moving. Uh, so, this, most of the core and center of our district is sedimentary rocks, which are quite, um, quite broken up as one of the block thon. And subject to quite a quite high temperatures because we're in a subtropical climate and they're subject to quite a lot of rainfall. So, that means the land is developed to be soon. Most of the central part of the district there. The east, the west coast is mostly comprised of. Consolidated sand dune built up from the, coming off the, the winds coming off the sea, built up sand dunes along here. And then the local rivers, which drain a lot of north of Myra and its tributaries, and that's built up um, a lot of river flats, fertile river country, that country in, in, in the uh, northern Myra delta area there. We need to be concerned about things like climate change, sea level rise, given we've got quite a large. I think it's low lying. Also, we've got a lot of um, a lot of it's built around these rivers in their waterways. So it's a concern here. Keep moving. Yeah. Very good. Okay, we'll skip over the slide because uh, yeah. <laughs> I can talk. I can largely talk to this one as part of the next one. I appreciate you guys are on schedule. So. But now is the people, the people in the district, and uh, different parts of our district are growing at different paces for different, and for different reasons. So there's, you know, not so much a, sort of a cohesive district growing, growing at the same rate or for the same. There's different trends going on in different parts of our district. So if we start by looking at Mangafai, historically a lot of uh, growth has been in Mangafai and projected to continue to be Mangafai. And what's driving that? It's um, Historically, it was people building holiday homes and people retiring out of Auckland, particularly retiring early, um, moving to Mangafai as a coastal retirement destination or uh, building holiday homes. What's now happening, though, as Auckland has grown more and more further north, it's grown onto the North Shore, into Albany, we've now got employment um, offices and things moving into places like Ivory and Auckland. Mangafai is now commutable. Um, but to the Auckland North Shore, you can work from home three days a week and two days a week. You jump in the car and go to, to the office on the North Shore of Auckland. And that's encouraging more young families to move to Mungafai and change the demographics and also continuing to fuel the growth of Mungafai. If we look within Mungafai, so Mungafai is Mungafai Village, um, stats and also Mungafai. Um, we see growth starting to the earthquakes that can be up. Any other more free land to build more houses. Um, we see the same thing starts to happen in Mangafai Heaves. Mangafai Rural, which includes the Mangafai Central subdivision, that doesn't have that issue. So that continues to grow, but it does start to slow, the growth does start to slow down. And that's in line with New Zealand's growth, population growth slowing down. So Mangafai is still a desirable place to move to. It's still got um, free land to go and build there. But the number of people who are in the country and want to want to able to want to move there is, is decreasing as the population growth is pulsed both now. We look at the other areas of the district, and perhaps the exception of Kaiwaka, which experiences some of the same trends to modify. The rest of the district is very much um, driven by local employment. Mark, Mark, can I interrupt you? This is I've got the question in my head. What's driving the slowing down, in your opinion? Is it lack of immigration, lack of birth rate, combination? So what was what we're seeing is in New Zealand that you're going to have population you're having population aging as um as sort of less less um less children being born, but also they've got that um, baby boomer um, uh, 
cohort, which is quite a large cohort. Um, so sort of, they've especially just been skewing the population um, right through as they move through their teenage years, their working age, and as they start to move into retirement as well. So that, um, so there's, there's that moving through. There's also, and there's that contributes to an aging of the population, uh, there's, there's births, and then it's going to be increasing deaths. So there's, there's that happening. The thing is, that's not just New Zealand. It's happening around the world as well. And that means that if we start to say, we're open for migrants, we'd like more migrants, please, there's a lot of other, because we, we foresee there'll be more countries around the world saying the same thing. And also a lot of the countries we were having rapid population growth are also starting to slow down their population growth as well. So there's less of a pull of migrants and more demand for them as well. So New Zealand's population growth is projected to slow. Um, that that was as well effects for, for the Piper, Piper district for all areas of the Piper district. There's less people to attract. Um, so if we look at the other areas, so as I say, it's local um, employment seems to be what drives the growth. So Dargaville and um, Mangatoroto both have um, protocol manufacturing and a bit more of a diversified um, service-based industry, uh, sorry, um, economy. And that sees quite a bit of population growth, um, employment growth and population growth being driven by that. In addition, Dargaville also has the Tito Tokarau Water Trust um, looking to provide water and facilitate the transition of land into water culture and high value crops. And those will need to be supported by tech houses and so on. Um, so that will also drive more growth in the dark area. So we see continuing stable growth as a result of that. Areas which are more dependent on pastoral agriculture for their economic base see slower growth. Everywhere <coughs> does grow, but some areas don't grow by a great deal. And particularly with the pastoral um, economy, what we're seeing there is that some years now, particularly dairy, has been shedding a lot of jobs. And what's happening there is that um, you know, improved with better mechanization, going from a collection of small farms with each little herringbone cow shed to having a bigger farm with um, a large rotary cow shed. And, you know, that's that's driving um, has been for some years now been driving a decline in the number of people working in the dairy uh, the dairy industry, and we see that continuing. The other thing which we see happening is plantation forestry for carbon forestry. Um, since you land me from these pine trees and then no one really works in their land and it's pruning pine trees or milling pine trees just you know for, for farming the land it just goes into carbon forestry. So that, that's that's something which the metrics have flagged to us and said some of those areas will see this growth therefore there's population growth as a result of that. Yeah. Mark, just to, to the mere just while you're on that subject, there's quite a violent bump yes. there for the West Coast. And Dargaville in there, just a very short, like a two year period, quite a steep curve. Um, whereas the Mungafly has sort of been a good climb for the last five to 10 years, yes? That, that's, is that concerning, that violent bump? Because if it continues like that, we've got major problems here, haven't we? Yeah, so with that, with that violence, that violent bump, um, so. Gosh, the violent bump, we call that. Um, <laughs> you, uh, you, you'd need to be experienced in driving Kuiper roads to, to travel that far. <laughs> but, yeah. Certainly with the roads, yes. Yeah. Um, but um, what's, what seems to happen now, if you look at Dargaville, I mean, you can actually graph employment and you can graph population. And um, those, up until about 2014, both of them were sort of like flat lining. And then uh, from 20, about 2014, they both started to increase together. Um, so there's sort of been there's, there's sort of a couple of things I think which has driven that. One is employment growth uh, for sure. The other thing was a bit of out migration from Auckland. Uh, people was, were retiring, you know, re retiring to Darwin as well. Not just so, not just to Mangafai. Um, Mangafai saw the bulk of that, but some of that also came to Darwin. And when you've got such a limited amount of population growth, um, having a people to, uh, group of people sort of turning up from Auckland to retiring, that does sort of wi fi growth growth that we, we did see um, issues as part of that, particularly um, uh, rental houses became very hard to source and targetable. Um, that, that situation, I don't think, is quite alleviated as yet either. So, it's a, bit of, a little bit of housing shortage and targetable. But um, some of that's also to do with the economics of building a house as well versus buying a targetable. So, it's been a bit, it's been a bit of, bit of um, concern caused by that with a, a recent flood of population growth. Uh, but it's not projected to continue. It's projected to be sort of a short-lived sort of. And it's sort of 
could probably best be thought of, I think, as like a bit of a wave of our migration for the sort of recently started to come forward. Thank you. Talk about the well being of our communities. It varies a bit from place to place, some places are better than others. On the whole, our well being in Piper is not particularly great. Um, with quite a few people living in quite a number of people living in deprivation. Um, one of the um, key things we did, did brings down our score for the deprivation index is access to services. And we hardly accept that, that we live in a rural district and rural areas, you uh, have to drive a bit further to get to services. But at the same time, that's also an area of potentially we have improvements. Um, Limited, limited local services. And the other thing which is concerning is um, lower median household incomes. Lower household incomes. And that also makes houses really housing more affordable, not necessarily because the houses themselves are more expensive, but because your income relative to the cost of that house might be. Going on to the next slide. Take time to absorb that. <laughs> what my next slide is, but um, my computer keeps going. There we go. Okay, our economy. So, very much founded on kite production. Uh, very much founded on kite production, very much founded on the primary sector. Uh, manufacturing is also quite a strong part of our economy, but a lot of that is tied to the primary sector. For example, the Dargaville Meatworks. Um, Monterra and uh, Roto, and even local businesses that are manufacturing things like plastic water tanks, which we use, use on farms. So, kind of got all eggs in the one basket there, and uh, that's a risk. Uh, throughout, throughout COVID um, and the pandemic, that was really good. Our economy performed really strong. Everyone still needed to eat, and one of those uh, businesses and um, essential services needed to keep running. So, that worked really well, but when we have a flood or a drought, we're in trouble. So, that's sort of the State of our economy there. Next slide, please. Um, it might have been a little bit of a slide stage on there, I guess. So, so tourism sector, uh, tourism in our, in our district is um, it's not a big part of our economy, but it's, um, it's growing quite strongly and it's largely focused around um, domestic tourists, people coming in, particularly from Auckland, it's a big, um, it's not the biggest domestic tourism market, and a lot of people coming here to spend their weekends. That's, that's a big contributor to our tourism. In terms of transport, connectivity um, is, in our district is not great, but it is improving, particularly the roads are improving. Uh, we've got to progressively move the motorways coming further north. Our state highways are having uh, incremental improvements, corner easing, et cetera, gradually over, over, over generations, I suppose. It's gradually improving, but it's it's not great. Um, particularly our rail network is not connected, uh, and that causes uh, that that reduces its usefulness to the range around uh, Auckland. The roads, uh, the state highway network, uh, roads are low resilience due to being built through all that material I described, uh, plus the high rainfall. Probably don't need to say too much more about that given recent events. Um, so there's, 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 a low, there's a low resilience there on the land side of things. On the seaward side of things, North Port's pretty great. Um, it's good the connectivity to um, international markets and to coastal shipping. It's also um, expanding um, in the future, becoming one of three strategic ports servicing the other North Island. But again, it's a bit of a stronger on the state highway side of things, um, outside of things, particularly. Um, and where we have alternative routes for state highways, something gets closed, we often have limited alternative routes, you can see through choke points, and also some of those local roads are most of the local roads are not built for the heavy traffic of the state highways. Um, in terms of airports, um, like rapid like rapid transit, and obviously we to talk about rapid transit. So air travel does provide rapid transit links around New Zealand. Um, and the one to watch on stolen control of Ocean Flyers website, they're planning to start flying in 2025. That signals the potential service between Auckland and Monterey. The reason I'm saying that's something to watch is to take you from CBD to CBD instead of taking your way out to Manukau somewhere. So that's sort of a what, what effect that will have on transport details for the to be seen, but it's maybe something to watch there if we go to the next slide. Excuse me, right? Oh, sorry, sorry, Mr. Mayor. Just, I was just curious to know what, what the um, the vehicle was on the previous slide. Was that one of your famous uh, hovercraft? <laughs> that was an Asian hovercraft. <laughs> ocean flyer. The ocean flyer that he just spoke about. Oh, 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 is, that, is that company for Persian operators? Yeah. 
The company's proposing to operate in 225, you were saying. 225, they anticipate beginning operations in New Zealand in 2025. And they've, they've signaled their service to um, Auckland to Wongarang, but um, they're also saying they want to try and bring services to other areas which might not previously have had services. Oh, interesting. There it is. Okay. In telecommunications. <coughs> Again, talked more recently, but um, looking at that longer term, longer term picture, um, telecommunications are improving over the past few years. There's been reductions in black spots. There's been more rollout, more rollout of that um, fiber broadband. So that's all that's been improving. Um, local power generation is also increasing. We've got um, solar and wind developments coming to Dargaville area. And we've also just over our border to the north, we've got Nafa power station, geothermal power station um, has just been expanded and it's got um, further expansion consented. Um, there's been a bit of an issue with supply and power to Mungify, given how fast Mungify is growing and the number of people spreading their hands up saying, I'd like a connection to my property, I'd like a connection. Um, uh, I think like, like many of us at times have underestimated how fast Mungify can grow. And um, they've got three projects um, in the pipeline to create that. So, I'm not going to more on just here. Next slide, please. It's four waters if you want to start talking. Four waters? So, four waters. Targables uh, um, has a low resilience supply. So we regularly have water restrictions in Tigerville when things get dry. We also have a lot of our districts protected by land drainage works. We're the second largest area in New Zealand to be protected by the second largest area of land in New Zealand is protected by land drainage works after the Horaki Plains. So that's quite a significant one for us. And as um, as we have sea level rise, um, that's something which we need to pay pay attention to. Um, we've also got uh, mentioned the water storage um, to talk about our water storage, um, bringing water for Horticulture um, and Mangafai, Papua's largest town, is almost completely dependent on private rainwater tanks for its water supply. And that can cause issues if we have, um, we have a drought for a long dry period and everyone's water tanks now in that town start to run dry about the same time. We didn't have to track a whole town load down. That's, that's a concern. Um, slide, please. Social infrastructure. Social infrastructure. And um, this is one that we have one library only in Kaipa, um, but we are supporting um, four community libraries as well. And we've got plans to build a new library in Dargaville, a new library in Dargaville, and also a new library in Mungafly. Um, there's presently no secondary school in Mungafly, and uh, students can travel to Quite some distance to the area areas. Um, Piper is suffering from a lack of healthcare services, so quite a, to have a full range of healthcare services, you don't need to travel to outside the district. Um, recreation is changing. There was um, a study done by Sport and Northland, which found that um, it's less focus now in the community on like, on the um, traditional team sports, where to get out kayaking, or hiking, or mountain biking. Um, and the dispersed nature of the district means it's difficult to provide everyone and every community in the district with a full range of sports facilities and facilities. People often have to drive Thanks, sir. Um, on your full water slide, yes. you said Mungafai, Copra's largest town, and yet that totally contradicts the graph you gave. And I estimate the Mungafai two areas about 4,000 population, Douglas 5,500. Nice, no, because for Mungafai, we um, summit. So what we do is we take what Stacey and Zed call Mungafai, as well the rest of us would call Mungafai Village. Yeah. Got Mangafai Heads and then you got Mangafai Rural, which Mangafai Rural actually essential. So we take the three of them together and we say, put someone together. 
Um, so all that man requires population now is about, I think it's getting close to close to 7,000. So you're including, when you say Magafi Township, you're including all the lifestyle blocks all surrounding it? The uh, lifestyle block belt around it as well, at the period of it. But you don't do it here? Yeah, because we've got post. <laughs> Why? Oh, so with, with Dargaval, um, the, the boundary for the, um, what they call the SA2, which is a really weird name, but anyway, that's quite small and sort of just captures that immediate urban area. But as you say, you've also got, um, like Tacopa, it's 10 minutes away. It's pretty much a suburb, a satellite suburb. Same with Bailey's, it's about 15 minutes away. It's, it's commutable. And in Prometrics, when they did the population projections, took that all into account and said, look, you know, this is the line, but we just put the elements over the line as well. It's, and they looked at what's, again, the trends, what's driving that growth. And they say, if you build a factory in Dargaville, you employ 100 people, they won't necessarily all live in the day the say too. They might be driving over from Bailey's or Tacopa. So they built that in. Annoyingly, though, it also will get portion to what's called Mungway, oh, sorry, Kuiper Coastal. And Kuiper Coastal goes from Koto all the way up to um, Aranga. So it's quite hard to sort of see what is happening in Tacopa or Bailey's. Thanks for coming Hi, um, my question is just around can we take a um, step right back and can you like explain like who? Who funds you? What's your position? Are you with council? Like, sorry, that you kind of just jump straight into it. And also, like, who you partner with, who you work with, where the data comes from, just like a very high level summary. I don't want to, yeah, go into all of the detail. So, I'm Mark Shrews. I work for the Kaipo District Council on Infrastructure Strategic, infrastructure strategic Planner. Um, the environmental scan is prepared by the Kaipo District Council. Um, it's sort of like a base to start informing the to inform the region planning. Uh, although we, the document goes live on our website um, and it's used by the community as well. They will do like um, application funding, et cetera, like pull that's out of it to support the application. It's quite a useful document, it does a lot of range of purposes. Uh, in terms of preparing it, what we've done in previous years, I've pulled together with um, sort of regular source of data from various sources, including stats and metrics. This time we round, we actually asked the metrics that rather than be writing the non economist, rather than be writing the economy section, having you peer review it, why don't you guys just write our economics section? So they've written that section. The population projections, again, you need someone quite specialized to peer those. So council had um, teamed up with the other more councils and all the councils together. We procured um, through infometrics, population and household, and also rating new projections for different different councils for those SA2 areas. So so it's more or less how we've gone about preparing that. Um, there's various um, studies and reports that are referenced in this, um, again, going into topics like soil, geology, genetic hazards, et cetera, which, again, we're just giving a high level summary in this document um, with all of the sort of available. The other thing which um, you might want to check out is if you go on the Kaipo District Council website and you um, search for economic data, we've got a page there which actually has links to all the dashboards from the metric, all the data. You can get um, regular economic talks to regular um, monthly economic updates they give out, and also they've got um, quarterly, so quarterly reports as well on how the Kuiper economy is performing, as well as the annual data as to how our structured. So that's all available to you um, on the council's website, available to the community as well. Supplementary. Um, so when you say that this informs the long term plan, how much weight is your work given? To informing that. So there's different, like I said, this is um, which draws together a lot of different sources. The key one in there is probably the population projections and household projections. Yeah. Uh, those are the key projections for council. So the feed by metrics, sort of the best data at the time. And that is what we will use um, when we go to do things like setting rates, looking at like if we're going to set the rates because rate, the rate goes on a household. So those household projections become very important. Rate and unit projections, which are not covered in the scan, but um, we do have those separately on the file, right? So we've got rating unit projections. So we can look at like, how would you divide the you know, cost of the community of so much? How can that be spread across the community? Particularly when we go to talk about things like um, development contributions, we're gonna build a particular project funded from development contributions. How much growth do we actually anticipate coming into that area? It's all gonna involve to say, we're gonna consent a subdivision of a hundred lots, but if the population growth or household growth is only 50 households, Thank you, Mark. Councillor um, Rachel Williams. Thank you, 
Thank you through the chair. Um, I just wondered going through the draft document and it says it's um, from 2020 on the draft. A few of the, um, the boxes and the figures that are on there, they've got data from 2014 and 2016, like on soil moisture, rainfall and temperature. Will those be updated with, with the recent statistics um, or findings from that? I just thought it's quite a, a you know, a, a big jump from that date to where we are now. And if there is going to be um, updated information put into the draft. Okay, so some of the reports that are referenced are quite dated, particularly things like our climate um, and also things like our geology and our soil. These things don't change so much. Uh, then also our understanding of them can improve, but generally geology doesn't change that much. The weather and climate will be an interesting one to watch because we just had a so we have a few talks with some of our um, engineers and that around to what extent the recent rainfall events will start to skew the data as we sort of reevaluate what is a one in one hundred year storm. Um, but so far, nothing's been nothing's really been released. I don't think any more relevant or recent than that. So there's it's referencing a report from that year, which was what would be quite an in-depth report into that aspect, and it's repeating the finding, key findings from that, summarising the key findings. Okay, thank you. Further question? That's what Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a small point, Mark. Um, in the executive summary of the report, um, you refer at the end in terms of there's a reference here on, on the last page to Dargle Central Business District and Rural Wide Township and so on have um, a land being part of a land drainage scheme. And except in the main report, it, it only seems to refer to it being a stormwater scheme, because I wasn't aware of there being a land drainage scheme in Dargaville. So this, like, that was just more flood protection as opposed to land drainage. Yeah, there's a tricky line between land drainage as well as your land drainage districts and drainage areas. You have stormwater and you've got flood protection and then coastal protection works as well. Um, so they will get divvied up, won't they, with the reform process? Because we will get to keep land drainage, but stormwater will be passed over to the new entity. I'm not sure where we're going with flood protection. And it's sort of what which basket you put in. Some of the assembly infrastructure is fine. That's the so probably that should help us. We also think as well. Some of that's not so well. Okay, thank you. As long as you're aware of it, yeah. Any further questions? Is that, is that you complete, Mark? I'd just like to say thank you for your presentation. Um, kind of confirms, I think, um, the direction that we agreed at our, our, um, at our um, retreat where we. I think collectively we all knew that we had to try and stimulate some growth in our district. Council <laughs> was on the money about depopulation. Those figures are there. So, you know, we are in competition for people and for talents and for investment. So I think that's going to be a really important document for us in preparing the long term plan. Thank you very much. Oh, Councillor Madison, do you have a question? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, can I ask, Mr. Uh, have you graphed or looked at the depopulation by immigration, say, to Australia? I've increasingly got comments from younger people that they're looking uh, at going to Australia, seeing our economy is stalled, our houses are so dear, and the salaries and living situations in Australia appear appealing to them. Yes, so we have um, looked in detail at um, health specifically. We look more at um, bigger scale net migration. So there are in terms of where people are coming to, I think the best data we get from we get on that is done with the census. So the previous environmental scan was done more closer to the time of the census um, and it did take some um, information Regarding where people are coming to Kaipara from and where people are going away to. Um, we didn't repeat that again because it's getting a bit dated now. Um, 
but that, that will still be the most recent data which we have um, to the previous environmental scan. But um, the focus here is we're on net migration. So rather than focusing so much on just who's leaving from where to where, the total are we growing from net migration or are we declining from net migration? Are, are more people leaving than anything? Um, which is which is which is quite an interesting one to look at, um, especially if the changes to Auckland, for example, that um, you know, Auckland actually now has population um, decline, population growth with um, natural increase, but there's actually more people leaving than coming in. Um, that, that might start to reverse down the borders of reopening. Next, Madison. And correct me if I'm wrong. I, I I think that people would better understand our landforms if you had indicated that most of Northland are undersea deposits that have slipped from the Kermadex over the existing land mass. They are highly erodible. Uh, they've often been referred to as the Onorahi chaos. They're so complicated. Yeah, yeah. 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 so as I said, Northland and Loch Fyne are one. Yeah, too deep into that, given the time constraints. Um, it's really with Loch Fyne and what that does for us. Thank you. Thank you. So um, we'll move on to Hayley Worthington, who presents the uh, local government reform submission. Um, so uh, this item is in response to was it last week uh, last week's council meeting um, where we provided our submission to go to the portal for the future for local government uh, alongside the draft report uh, so council requested that the CE requested an extension um, for this the portal and uh, as of today, we haven't received a response from GIA, so we're still awaiting to hear that. Um, so I have attached the draft report again to your pack, so I apologise for that because it is about 260 pages long, and if you had to print it, that might have been a bit troublesome. Um, so now we are again seeking feedback from elected members across those six key focus areas. Um, I have received feedback from um, Councillor Wilson Collins, uh, Councillor Peniora, and also Councillor uh, Vincent. Um, so, if you would like to provide more um, feedback, we can incorporate that into our response and circulate it back to you. Um, and if not, then I guess we leave it where it is. Councillor Larson, your worship, yeah. Is that feedback not really contingent upon you getting an extension and therefore should we not wait until such time as you have an extension approved <coughs> we go to the trouble of providing feedback? Good question. Yeah, so we I did chase them again yesterday asking them um, for confirmation of the extension date and they said that they were still investigating. So um, I haven't had confirmation that they can extend that date. So. I guess it's it's optional for this council if they want to provide feedback to send to the DIA. That's not the point I'm making. I'm, the point I'm making is what is the point of us providing feedback if we don't yet have confirmation that it even be an extension? Um, in regards to timeframes, this is the the first briefing since our um, meeting last week. Uh, this is when we were asked to come back. So. Um, we're, we're preempting that. <laughs> yeah, three years to me if I could. So, so we've got kind of two options here. Um, the time frame's passed. We can either just agree to disagree and let it lie and nod to a submission, just reflecting what the council decided last week, though, which is try and seek an extension. Um, if we did get an extension, I doubt it would be very long. So if you want us to proceed with crafting a submission on the provider that it gets extended, then we could. Uh, get that drafted to come to a council meeting, the next council meeting for adoption, right? So we could do that. Admittedly, it could be a bit of work for mm -hmm. no gain uh, as well. Um, but also, you know, council in the discussion last Wednesday talked about the fact that there's personal submissions that could be done. So we're in your hands, really. We need to seek direction. Do you want to spend time and effort providing feedback and us crafting a submission and getting approved? 
on the hope that it gets extended, or do you want us to just pause it and leave no, it? Councillor Larson. Um, I, I'd like to not put any more resource into it and just let it roll, let it go. Councillor Winston. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, we could do that. And by the time we get confirmation back from um, the IA, then we find we haven't got enough time to put a submission together. So, um, I, whether we are able to put in a submission out of time or not, I'd be interested to know what my colleagues think on the issue because it is sort of existential in its nature. So, I'm, I would quite like to. Even it might be useful for us just to have a round the table discussion. Where people present their views. I've already done mine, um, and I'd like to know if I'm um, a, a lone wolf um, barking in the wilderness, or um, is it in the company of others with a similar thought. That's all right. I thank you, Your Worship. Um, yeah, just to be clear, I, my point was I didn't think it was worth putting. Re any further staff resource towards picking up another submission, whether we got an extension or not. I just think the whole proposal is so far out of whack that um, I don't think that central government will listen listen to anything we say to them anyway. Just That's do whatever they want to do. So <laughs> move on. Let's try and affect things that we can affect for our local. <clears throat> yeah. I see. There's. A, 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 can I give I'm wrong? Uh, Jason, but there's avenues for personal submissions. Too, They're closed. They've closed now, though. So they closed yesterday. Submissions, but yeah. So, you, so we did have that discussion at council meeting last week, and it, obviously, as I Vincent, you shared your personal submission, so the opportunity was there. My personal submission was the submission was the feedback mm. I gave, which was in the submission, which I which I put in when I provided that feedback before December the twenty first. Okay. If you permit, Mr. Mayor, one thing I found interesting when I went to lodge my submission is that um, it was the old uh, policy planner trick of controlling the the um, narrative by setting out it setting out what the questions were they wanted answered, rather than giving um, a freer opportunity to, for ones to want to express one's views. I didn't feel bound by it, so I left most of the boxes blank. And plugged my submission in. Yeah, any other. That was my objection to it. To to it was that local government New Zealand tends to want to dictate what, what they want you to feed them. That, and they'll make that the wasn't local government New Zealand, I don't think. And they make no, it, they want to. So I'd rather I'd rather not waste the resources on it. Councillor Penyora. Um. So we've already wasted the resources on it by. <laughs> Drafting to a degree, we have submission. We're drafting the submission that yeah, was proposed, them. and I spent quite a considerable amount of my own time um, reviewing it and um, including the amendments that I thought were necessary. I also um, put my thoughts and feelings into the draft submission. Um, we agreed to. During our formal meeting to defer the process to follow a process. So, um, for us to now go back on that is, uh, uh, yeah, even further disheartening. Um, this is this is one of the key. We we hear meeting after meeting members complaining about central government. And then the one opportunity that we have to actually put in a submission to say what we think and feel, and now I'm hearing members saying, oh, it's a waste of time. Um, that's the democracy that we live in, that uh, submissions are to be considered by central government. Um, we're doing a disservice to the people that we represent. I personally am in, in agreement with most of the reforms, so this is no skin off my, my nose for so the reforms, um, if you if you've read them, are probably much worse in your own views and opinions um, than what the submission was. Um, so my my direction is to follow through with the process that we agreed on. Um, I think that that's 
that we have a duty now to do that. That was a formal vote and went to a formal vote and it was passed. Um, so yeah, requesting an extension and then going through and seeing whether we can get a, um, an extension and then the next step in looking if we can come to some sort of a agreement on that submission. Councillor the Williams. Through the chair. Um, yeah, I'm, I will work towards the, um, the 10th of March deadline. Um, I've been a bit slow off the bat to be involved with it and, and reading it and for whatever reason. Um, so I will endeavour to, yeah, make some comments and some recommendations by that date. That's the best depending on whether we get an extension, right? Oh, okay. Well, I'll, I'll start working on it anyway in case there is a um, extension. So yeah, so can I just clarify? See, so we're going with uh, with what you agreed at the council meeting last week. So provide feedback. Did the, do we get the tenth of March time frame? Yeah. We get that date from. When do, when do we get a response? Do you know? So we were we were just waiting for that response, um, and I think them again just about an hour ago. But yeah, still not. Okay, so we've got no response from DIA yet. So. We don't know whether or not it's been extended. The submissions have closed. However, you want us, what I'm hearing is you want us to continue getting your feedback, drafting the submission that could be put through. Is that what I'm, is that fair? That's what the resolution says. Yeah, that was. Yeah. Um, can I just confirm that um, if we do receive approval for an extension, um, we'll circulate that back and bring it back to the next. So it depends on the, so it depends on the time frame, Haley. Uh, if, if in fact uh, we can meet the council meeting to do it and get it formally signed off, we'll do that. Um, that's fine. Uh, if we can't, I say extend it for a, a week or two, uh, which is possible. Then what we'll have to do is there's a, there's a delegation in place with the mayor and one other councillor to approve the submission and to report back for information. So that's the that delegation. Okay, so let's start. It. We want to do what we want to do. We might spend long time. Give us that feedback. Oh, good. Done that. Feedback, sorry. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, okay. This is um, Shireen. Monday will present the item on the smoked tobacco regulatory regime submission. Ta da. Ta Okay. Apologies, Your Worship. Is it okay to go proceed? Sorry, it's a little bit. Yeah, well, yeah, well, you go, Sheree. We can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Thank you. The Wi-Fi is just a bit sketchy. Um, so uh, just briefly, and I know um, councils have had a long day today. Um, uh, the reason this item has come to council was specifically because council was so heavily involved in the LGNZ uh, vaping uh, remit of last year. So um, just briefly to give you an overview, what has happened is um, there is a proposal to change the legislation around smoking and related matters, and it touches somewhat on um, the control of vaping outlets. And as such, uh, we have worked, um, this was um, came through as a result of legislative changes late last year. Uh, the proposal was published on the 4th of January this year, obviously giving Council a very short time frame to consider um, the matters in the proposal, with the submissions due date being very soon. So, um, uh, Te Fata Ora has kindly provided some proposed wording um, around, specifically around the vaping matter of the proposed changes and the, and the feedback on the proposed regu regulations rather than the broader matters that are covered in the consultation document and staff, i.e. myself, are looking for feedback on what council, what, if anything, council wishes to do about making a submission on this matter. Thank you. Um, I know that um, Councillor Erin Wilson Collins has a passion for this, so maybe Erin would like to talk to her a little bit. Oh, thank you. Um, thanks, Shireen. Nice. Kia yeah, yeah, kia ora. Absolutely. Last term, um, Kaipo District Council was very heavily involved in the remit to LGNZ, and it was something that a lot of the councillors around the table were very concerned about, um, and more so in relation, just to provide some background to 
our new councillors, um, especially in relation to the, the children that are being affected um, by how easily um, it is to get hold of vapes and the health effects that are happening. Um, we had a story of school aged children. Sorry, we had we had um, information given to us that there are primary school age children who end up having nicotine withdrawals and, and nicotine, nicotine overdoses because a cigarette ends and vapes do not. You can vape and vape and vape and vape and vape and vape and vape all you like. Um, so, yeah, so I, I'm really, um, really appreciate the work that's gone into this and agree with everything that that is in the suggestions for the submission. But I did have a couple of other um, queries, and I don't know if they fit within the submission framework of what the government is currently asking for. But one of the one of the matters I was interested to know about is the regulation of um, specialist vaping stores in line with other R18 products. Um, and so, insofar as like, for example, a liquor store um, is pretty much closed off to the street. They do have, they, they are allowed advertising, but it's closed off to the street and it's an R18 premise premises. Um, is that something that can be asked for or, or suggested for, for specialist vape stores as well? Um, on top of, on top of the other, uh, restrictions there about where they can be sold and whether they can be restricted to how many within a certain kilometer radius, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, through the chair, I can I, I can research that and include that in a draft. Absolutely, in terms of those wordings from the councillor. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Penny um, Yeah, I just fully total call this co-popper as well. Um, my suggestion, and I don't know where it sits, whether we could do some um, limit the the store hours to sort of like nine to three when school kids are at school and not able to access the premises. I don't know where that sits. Whether that would sit, um, yeah, with something that we as council can do, or, or through the, yeah, through the submissions. That's my, and yeah, my thoughts on that. Would you like me to respond to that, Chair? Certainly. Um, thank you, thank you, through the Chair. Yes. As I understand it, the, um, the this is regulation; it's not legislation. So the kind of restrictions suggested here are probably going to be required through the legislative process and that was not anticipated, nor was it provided for in the legislation that was just amended late last year. I would expect that that's not a policy, uh, possibility to be included in the regulations about limiting hours. Um, the proposal is very clear on what it will and what it won't do, and it's very clearly stating um, quite a number of matters that are outside of the scope of a regulatory tool as opposed to legislative changes. Thank you. Um, but I, I would definitely, I can research it and include it. Uh, absolutely happy to do that. Thank you, Councillor Vincent. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. If I could just uh, comment, in some respects, it's a good news, bad news story, in that uh, here was this little country council. Um, and one of our councillors in particular, uh, Karen Joyce Puckey, had a, a real concern about this and took it a step further. And we got to the point of it being endorsed by the rest of the Northland councils through the uh, Government of New Zealand, which then took it to national conference and it got endorsed by 87% of the councils um, as a, a desirable proposition to pursue, to take it with the government. And something actually happened. However, um, that's the good news part of things. So you can actually have an effect by starting with an idea yourself and building it up in, in um, less than 12 months. But to me, the, the downside is that um, it really just sort of bounces off the side of the issue and that it, it doesn't really provide a, a comprehensive solution because it looks like we're going to, firstly, it doesn't affect existing specialist vape retailers, of which we have 
it's a considerable number, particularly in Main Street of Dargaville. Um, and it also um, doesn't control the, um, the general vape retailers uh, either in terms of... So it's going to have a limited benefit, but I think in terms of the, um, keeping the faith in a way that we should uh, follow through and, and, and be making a submission as suggested. Thank you. I'd be interested actually to hear what um, our planning advisor has to say on that, because I could be well clear of the mark there. <clears throat> Um, through the chair, um, the the proposals um, through the regulations don't um, uh, the 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 research that I've done they don't go um, very close to they they go somewhat towards but they absolutely do not go um, quite as far as councillor as the LGNZ remit had proposed. This is this is correct. So uh, it is a small step, but um, it it is limited, and the consultation document makes very clear that it is limited in that way. Thank you, Shireen. Um, be interesting to see the submission. I think it's going to be highly supported by members that we need to try and find ways nationally to, particularly with short, to reduce them right, uh, vaping, vaping, and vaping. Yeah. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of our. Briefing. Um, what I'd like to suggest that members would, um, after staff have left, if members would like to have um, a little bit of EM time, discuss a few things, um, particularly um, 